Just give me one moment to make sure the live stream is rolling. Starting it right now. We are good to go, thank you. At this time, will all sergeants please start their recordings. Recording to the computer has begun. Cloud recording on the way. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committee on Public Housing, joint with the Subcommittee on Capital Budget. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes. When we ask to minimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. And if you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Good afternoon, and thank you all for attending today's joint hearing of the Committee on Public Housing and the Subcommittee on the Capital Budget. I am Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel, and I am the Chair of the Council's Committee on Public Housing. Today, the committees will be taking a closer look at NYCHA's capital spending, with particular attention to how NYCHA is spending city allocated funds. I would like to thank my colleague, Council Member Helen Rosenthal for co-chairing this important hearing with me. And I would also like to take the time to acknowledge that we are joined today by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, Minority Leader Matteo, Council Member Diaz Sr., Council Member Joni, Council Member Kevin Riley, Council Member Van Bramer, Council Member Ayala, Council Member Feliz, Council Member Adams, Council Member Brooks Powers, and Council Member Gradenchik. As I open this hearing, I reflect on the many times we have convened over the past four years. I always remind my colleagues, NYCHA residents and NYCHA executive leadership, that the main goal is to improve and increase the level of service delivered to the residents of the New York City Housing Authority New York City's largest landlord. Nearly one year ago, on December 30th, 2020, NYCHA released its five-year capital plan, which provides $7.4 billion in planned commitments to improve NYCHA's infrastructure. The plan includes federal, state, and city capital funding, the latter accounting for about 40% of the total funding. A large swatch of that 40% includes approximately $1.6 billion, which is dedicated to addressing the major issue areas outlined in the 2019 HUD agreement, lead-based paint problems, remediating mold, providing heat, repairing elevators, and eliminating pests. The agreement notwithstanding, even where notable progress has been made, major issues continue to persist in the major pillar areas. Residents continue to be plagued with elevators that have been out of service for weeks on end, long-term gas shutoffs, mold and mold-related sickness, extreme cold in units, lack of groundskeeping, broken locks, safety breaches, and more. Addressing these issues in any meaningful way is costly. They require major, cool, major physical improvements and not just band-aids or quick fix solutions. According to NYCHA's 2017 physical needs assessment, NYCHA estimates that its projected capital costs are about $31.8 billion over a five-year period and an additional 45.2 billion over 20 years. Those are big figures. And whenever issues with heat, mold, lead, elevators, and pests are raised with NYCHA, the response is just, there's a lack of capital to really address all of the problems. But we also don't have a clear understanding of what is being done 
and what has been completed. The HUD agreement requires the city to provide funding on top of what NYCHA receives from the federal government to address these issues. As I've mentioned, NYCHA's current five-year plan includes 1.6 billion city dollars with the HUD agreement requiring the city to provide a total of 2.2 billion in incremental capital funding over 10 years. It may not be enough to address all of NYCHA's capital needs, but it's a major funding source that is available to NYCHA. Oddly, NYCHA's capital commitment rate is low. In fiscal year 2021, NYCHA committed just 103.1 million of the $1.6 billion. So when we hear NYCHA say, we don't have the money, we don't have the money, what this council is saying, here is a significant sum of money. What are you doing with it? And why are you not spending it in that certain way to address certain problems? That's the critical question that we hope to hear an answer to today. As always, the point of this hearing is to have a meaningful conversation about capital resources available to NYCHA, how NYCHA is using those resources, and if not, why not? And to think about ways that those resources can be used most efficiently to deliver the best possible service to NYCHA residents. We know that NYCHA's aging housing stock creates a complex dynamic as many buildings are actively falling into increasingly worse states of disrepair. And we know that the needs are so great that they even overshadow the progress that's being made. Today is one of the last hearings that I will have as the chair of this committee as we move closer to December 31st. And I would be remiss if I didn't again suggest a friendly user capital tracking tool with snapshots at any given point in time that are, you know, that would be extremely important to the residents and the public. I know where we were four years ago. And as we get a picture of where we are today, it would be ever helpful for my incoming colleagues to be able to obtain this information of where NYCHA is right now as it relates to its capital needs and its designations so that everyone can have a better start come January. So with that, I will turn it over to my co-chair, Council Member Helen Rosenthal for her opening remarks. Thank you so much, Chair Embry Samuel. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Council Member Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Subcommittee on Capital Budget. Um, Council Member and Chair uh, Embry Samuel um, laid out the issues that are relevant here so very well, and I don't want to repeat too much, um, but I do want to reiterate that it's no secret that NYCHA has a tremendous need for capital improvements. NYCHA's reports themselves demonstrate that need. The need is billions upon billions of dollars, and with every five-year plan, those dollar amounts needed increase exponentially. While this NYCHA may not have at its fingers the total amount of money that it needs, it does have a significant amount of money. And NYCHA is not spending that money. Obviously, when you don't spend the money, things only get worse. And the state of disrepair gets worse. So we have to wonder what's going on here. At the last budget hearing, Chair Russ said that it's much easier to spend federal and state dollars. And therefore, NYCHA spends a greater percentage of their allocation of those dollars, but that the city procurement process is just too complicated and too difficult to be able to allow them to spend any city dollars. 
you know, the spending rate for other agencies, capital spending rate, while not at 100%, which is where we'd like to see it, is at least at 60, 61%. So DEP, DOT, they're, they have the ability, their capital project team has the ability to spend 61% of its city dollars. And I assume that they are available to the NYCHA capital team to let the NYCHA capital team know how they do it. Um, you know, I, I just want to end by saying that, um, as the chair mentioned, NYCHA now has a federal monitor to require NYCHA to spend money to fix certain issues, capital issues. And in May 2021, the monitor signed off on a NYCHA capital spending plan, which included detailed reporting requirements. Remember, this is a plan that NYCHA presented to the monitor. So it was their idea and it articulated exact reporting requirements which would get which would get at the transparency and identify where there might be challenges that we could help the NYCHA capital team overcome. The first report was due on October 31st of this year. And I've asked to see the report and have not heard back maybe at this hearing, NYCHA will present it. But in looking at the website for the monitor, I don't see it up there. So I'm looking forward to this hearing, looking forward to hearing about all the good work that NYCHA is doing to expedite spending so we can get at the hellacious uh, situation that we're in now uh, in terms of deteriorating capital. Thank you so much, Chair Impre Samuel. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. Um, as is customary for the Public Housing Committee, we will next hear from a panel of residents themselves before turning to NYCHA and the administration for their testimony. Um, so I will now turn it over to committee counsel Audrey Sun to go over some procedural items. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, my name is Audrey Sun. I'm counsel to the City Council's Committee on Public Housing. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, and when it is your turn, I will call your name and you will be unmuted. We will now hear from an opening panel of NYCHA residents, uh, followed by council member questions, if any. In order to hear from everyone, the clock will be set to two minutes. First, we will hear from Aixa Torres, and then we will hear from... Um, followed by uh, Mary McGee and followed then by Karen Blundell. Ms. Torres. Good afternoon, Chair Samuel and Chairwoman Rosenthal and all the members and my colleague, TA President Sarah Ms. Paul. I'm here as the president of the Resident Association of Africa Houses, but also as a steering committee member of Residents to Preserve Public Housing. One of the biggest issues that we are finding is that the 964 regulations are not being followed. Had they been followed, NYCHA would probably have spent all their money and then some that have been allocated because that would require that residents are listened to. And that 
I think that no one, as one of my uh, board members is always saying, we are on the ground. We, who better than us to assess what our needs are, what needs to get done. And because we're not listened to, we get all this constant outsourcing that is unconscionable at this point. Um, we are not listened to most of the time, and we are not part of the process. 964 requires that we are part of the process from conception when the thought is being formed. Um, Matt, sign this contract and this is what you're going to get. I know that the Sandy project in my development has been a total disaster, total. And that's because exactly what I'm saying has happened, even though those were federal funds. On the capital end for the city, they need to sit down individually with every resident association board, not president board, and speak to us about what are your needs? This is how much money has been allocated and how do we do this? We also should be part of the process in terms of who the contractor is. And for anyone in procurement, I know that you could go with the cheapest, right? That's usually, just give me one more minute, I'll finish. However, if you work a little bit harder, you can get the best and give us quality that we deserve as citizens and as taxpayers. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, we will now hear from Mary McGee, followed by Karen Blundell. I'm against. Uh, Hello, uh, my name is Mary McGee. I'm a resident of Fulton Houses. I think more needs to be done for our developments. There is a deficit. We, everybody knows that NYCHA needs money. They need more money, but they're not using the money they have to fix issues that can be resolved easily. We matter. The residents of NYCHA matter. NYCHA is doing the Rad Pack program now. So I don't understand why their deficit is still the amount they're saying. It should be going down if they're converting 66,000 units. So where's all this money gonna go that they're saying they need? To the existing developments, elevators are constantly breaking down. There's no heat, no hot water, but the repairs aren't being done. New York City gives NYCHA so much money but it's stuck in limbo. But who's paying the price? The residents. The residents pay the price for that funding to be stuck in limbo. The residents are paying the price because that red tape and the money can't be used. It takes a few years. You know, everybody depends on Congress to pass the housing, um, you know, funding. It's not happening. Nobody cares about public housing and we need to change that. Everybody deserves quality of life. They need um, respect because I feel nature residents aren't respected. They need to be heard. It's not everybody always complaining, oh, I have this, I don't have that, I need this, but we're paying our rent. We deserve that and more. So I'm asking this board to please Please help NYCHA get that funding out of that red tape and be able to use it to on those developments that really, really need it. It's shameful that it. we're, in, we're in heat season and developments don't have heat. So, you know, I, I thank you for your time and we need to find a better solution and help the residents that live in New York City Housing Authority. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. We will now hear from Karen Blundell. Good morning. Um, first, I'd like to say congratulations to Alika Ambry Samuels on becoming the next regional administrator for HUD in our region. 
Um, and thank you for your commitment to the public housing uh, uh, committee here at city council. My name is Karen Blondell. I founded the Public Housing Civic Association. It is a 501c3 whose mission is to educate public housing around climate change, around their indoor environment, and around the economics involving public housing that we don't get um, as Aisa Torres, one of the resident council leaders in Manhattan has just um, testified to. The 964 rules are not being followed. And here we are at the last minute being rushed through elections across the city by New York City Housing Authority in respect to the resident councils. And the fact that we don't even have bylaws, haven't seen them bylaws. And as we question the nomination committee and the bylaws, uh, we're not getting clear answers from New York City Housing Authority or the resident engagement. I wanna go to the budget that Alika was talking about. Um, it's not only about being given the money, but spending the money. We have residents who don't have any jobs, especially after this pandemic. We need all hands on deck. We need to open up the labor force so that it's competitive with union and non-union with prevailing wage in order to spend this money. We're not spending the money because there's a control on labor. We have all of our residents throughout public housing, especially in Red Hook, where we have a half a billion dollar job going on right outside my window. And those residents do not have access to those jobs and those jobs are not covered by section three. Um, these are the things that have to be corrected. And again, I'm Karen Blondell with the Public Housing Civic Association and we're here to make a change in public housing. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Uh, I'll now pass it back to Chair Ambry Samuel before moving into testimony from the administration. We have also been joined by Council Member Menchaca. I'm not sure if any other members are on, um, but that's what I see in front of my screen. So apologies if I did not recognize you, but I will recognize you um, at a later opportunity. Um, and also, Orge, I just want to make sure that we were able to call on all of the residents before we get started that wanted to speak. Sure, I'm checking the uh, participant panel now. If there are any other NYCHA residents uh, who are available to speak, we would love to hear from you at this time. Um, So please, yeah, just please re use the Zoom raise hand function and we'll call on you in turn, beginning with Ramona Ferreira, uh, followed by Dana Eldon and then Marquise Jenkins. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having this hearing, which is uh, extremely uh, timely. As the council member mentioned in the beginning, I submitted written um, testimony, so I'm not going to read that. Instead, I am going to highlight a couple of points and begin um, by talking about the six-year-old boy that passed away in my development at Mitchell Houses last week. Um, Aiden was six years old and was raised in public housing. This fire, which burned his father, um, half of his body, and killed Aiden through smoke inhalation, is something that we have been talking about a lot at Mitchell Houses. Um, I am convinced that NYCHA's inability to properly manage funding and to treat us with dignity and honor our rights as tenants of public housing is responsible for the death of Aiden. And I don't say that because the fire happened that night and they were trapped on the 14th floor. I say it because over the last 15 years, NYCHA has failed to properly administer the funding, remove the lead, the asbestos, the mold, the garbage, the drats, and the roaches that all contributed 
to aid in not having fully developed lungs, which is what children in public housing are growing up in every single day. I also want to raise the point that everyone is skirting, which is that public housing has been privatizing itself under the excuse of having obsolete units. In Aiden's building, there are four burnt out apartments that have been in that condition for more than six months. That's inexcusable. And the only reason that these apartments are being uncared for and not rehabilitated is so that NYCHA under Greg Russ's leadership can make the argument that these apartments should be condemned and therefore should qualify for tenant protection vouchers. At the I'm same sorry. time, I'll finish in one second. At the same time, Congress under the Build Back Better plan has had the audacity of issuing $1 billion in tenant protection vouchers, which would implement the blueprint proposal here in New York City, ignoring what tenants have been saying for the last 18 months. So what I would like to ask the council is to think of the children in public housing, to think of the broken promises that NYCHA has made and your responsibility as our advocates when these things come to part. Thank you. Thank you. We'll next hear from Dana Eldon. Go ahead. in the South Bronx. I too am a member of an organization referred to as Residents uh, to Prevent Public Housing, uh, to Preserve Public Housing. And what I wanted to speak to this afternoon with regard to the budget, the capital budget of NYCHA, uh, which I recently found out that monies that were allotted for capital projects was being sat on by NYCHA when I need six new roofs. One roof so severely damaged that the contractor told me that it felt like he was walking on brownies. Um, and it's not that NYCHA doesn't know about it. They've known about it since the time of the damage of the water tank bursting and damaging our roof and the apartments below where tenants still live in those apartments and are subject to mold uh, floors where you walk on them and as you step down with your feet, water comes up through the tiles. Uh, this situation has gone on too long. And knowing now what NYCHA has received in funding and how it still sits in their house when it was supposed to be used during the 2021 year is just unacceptable. So I speak to this council to dig deeper and to make NYCHA accountable for every dime that they have and make them use what was allotted for the residents and their repairs, make them use it. Enough is enough with this. We don't have money and we don't have this and we got to find contractors. They've been haphazard and everything that they've done for the residents in my development and I'm tired of it now. So this is why I'm here today and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Great, thank you very much. And we will next hear from Marquise Jenkins. Time is ready. Good afternoon. Thank you, Council Members Helen Rosenthal and Alika Ampli Samuels for holding today's hearing on NYCHA's capital spending for city funding. My name is Marquise Jenkins and I am a NYCHA resident and community organizer. Today I am speaking on behalf of the residents to preserve public housing. We are concerned with the inadequate amount of funding the city provides NYCHA for capital operating expenses. According to the city's finance report, the city allocated 248 million to NYCHA in 2021, leaving NYCHA with a predicted deficit of 25 million. NYCHA's Blueprint for Change proposal aims to generate 40 billion in 10 years by converting units to Section 8 and borrowing money. If the federal, state, and city government adequately funds NYCHA, that will eliminate NYCHA's argument for the need to shift to Section 8 funding and generate in private debt. While the city needs to significantly increase the amount of funding it allocates to NYCHA, 
we recognize that this, we recognize the sad reality that NYCHA, is, NYCHA has a track record of wasting and mismanaging funds. RPPH urges the city to attack strong conditions onto any and all funding they provide to NYCHA. NYCHA's chairman, Gregory Ross, struggles to manage the funds received for NYCHA's capital and operating expenses. NYCHA's total capital budget was 3.2 million in fiscal year 2020. It was budgeted to be 3.6 billion in fiscal year 2021. Of the 3.2 billion budgeted for fiscal year 20, they only spent 1.2 billion or 37.5% of the amount that was allocated. Chair, Chairman Russ continues to work with bad contractors. Russ has done um, nothing to hold them accountable. I'll fast forward to my closing. RPPH is asking the city council to allocate $2 billion annually for operating and uh, capital expenses, $1 billion for resident management. Uh, we want an independent audit. Uh, we want to hold regular meetings with residents uh, at the table deciding when and where these meetings are taking place. And of course, we want you to announce the blueprint and remove Gregory Ross as the chairman of NYCHA. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. And um, I also want to recognize that we've been joined by Council Member Traeger. And I'm not sure if I mentioned Council Member Ayala in the beginning, but, but she's also with us. Um, I want to just kind of recap everyone who spoke. Um, Alexa Torres mentioned the need for more resident input regarding all of the projects. Um, Mary McGee mentioned, you know, rad deals and the, the money that's being spent and that there's just too much red tape. Um, Karen Blondell mentioned it's not about being given money, it's about spending the money and this connection to labor and employment opportunities and also section three opportunities. Um, Ramona Ferreira talked about the death of six-year-old Aiden in Mitchell houses and um, connecting the fact that so much could have been done in order for little Aiden to even be able to breathe during the, um, the smoke in the apartment. Dana Eldon talked about the need for six new roofs in her development and hopefully understanding where hopefully during this conversation with NYCHA we'll be able to understand where her development is on that priority list for new roofs. Um, and Marquise Jenkins does what he usually does, you know, come in and, and lay it all out, um, you know, everything about why we are here today. And I really do appreciate you, Mr. Jenkins. Um, I mean, you mentioned implementing restrictions on funding and questioning the need for conversions with the funding that's coming in. Um, and so I just wanted to put that all out there because that sets the tone of what we're talking about and why we are here. And I, I thank you residents for always you know, showing up and giving your perspective. And um, I just hope in the administration, as you're answering a lot of the questions, you, know, you just make sure that you have in mind um, the voices that we heard um, at the beginning. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Audrey. Thank you very much, Chair. Oh, well, you know what, wait, I want to make sure, um, Chair Rosenthal, did you have any questions at all for, okay, okay. all right, okay, great, thank you both. Uh, we will now turn to testimony from the administration. A reminder to council members to please use the Zoom raise hand function if you would like to ask any questions. After the admi administration gives its testimony, we will hear from the remaining members of the public. I will now administer the oath to the administration, which is represented by Stephen Lovesey, Anika Lescott, Oliver Osterwind, Eva Trimble, and Brian Honan. After I say the oath, please wait for me to call your name and respond one by one. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Stephen Lovesey? I do. Anika Lescott? I do. Oliver Osterwind? I do. Eva Trimble? I do. And Brian Honan? I do. Thank you. You may begin when ready. Thank you. 
Chairs, Alika, Amper Samuel, and Helen Rosenthal, members of the Committee on Public Housing and the Subcommittee on Capital Budget, other distinguished members of the City Council, residents, and the members of the public. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Lovesey, NYCHA's Executive Vice President of Capital Projects. I am pleased to be joined by Anika Lescott, Executive Vice President of Finance and Chief Financial Officer, Eva Trimble, Executive Vice President for Strategy and Innovation, Oliver Osterwind, Vice President for Project Management in Capital Projects Division, Brian Honan, Vice President of Intergovernmental Relations, and other members of NYCHA's team. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss NYCHA's capital program, which is committed to preserving and modernizing public housing for NYCHA residents and the city of New York. Considering the authority's significant capital needs, 40 billion and climbing, we are incredibly grateful for the council's partnership and funding. Without your support, many important projects that contribute to the residents' quality of life would not be possible, such as playgrounds, basketball court renovations, new entrances, security cameras, and existing lighting installations. I'm sorry, exterior lighting installations. As the largest public housing authority in the nation, NYCHA manages a vast capital program that preserves and modernizes more than 2,200 buildings, housing nearly 400,000 residents, residing in over 2,400 acres across every borough of the city. However, decades of federal disinvestment has left our buildings needing 40 billion worth of major repairs. An astronomical feature, figure that grows at a rate of about a billion a year. To best address the significant needs of our developments and to protect our investments, NYCHA established a logical building sequence when planning its work. It begins with sealing the building envelope, the roofs, the facades, the windows, and then turning to building systems like heating plants. We can move into interior renovations and grounds. NYCHA's Capital Projects Division is responsible for implementing capital construction projects from planning and design through construction and closeout. Over the past two years, CPD has focused on the building sequence and comprehensive design strategies, uh, executing projects with the highest degree of safety and quality. The portfolio includes roof replacement, masonry repairs, heating plant replacement, elevator modernization, infrastructure upgrades, grounds improvements, exterior interior lighting, lobby entrances, CCTV, to name a few. NYCHA's 10 year, this is 2022 through 2031, city capital plan totals about 4.6 billion. The majority of the funds or about 4.4 billion are mayoral. More than half of those funds, 2.8 billion, are allocated toward projects addressing the HUD agreement pillar areas, such as heat, elevators, lead, and mold. NYCHA's city council funding totals about 125 million in the 10-year plan. The discretionary allocations from council members are essential source of funds for vital quality projects that benefit the residents greatly, such as playgrounds, basketball court renovations, exterior lighting installations, entrances, security enhancements, and community amenities. NYCHA takes responsibility for the frustrations around city council discretionary projects. And we are committed to improving our performance through new management and partnerships. For instance, CPD hired a new government liaison in 22 to streamline communication between all parties. We also established a project management team whose assignments involve city discretionary funding projects. This is a significant benefit so that we, we enhance, uh, we take the staff and they're more knowledgeable about the complexities of the city procurement and the lessons learned. To enhance, enhance transparency, NYCHA recently joined Checkbook New York City and by moving from paper 
to electronic submission of registration packages for the comptroller's office this year, we are speeding up the contract registration process while also providing ready insight into the status of these packages. And I'd like to thank OMB and comptroller's staff, particularly the IT departments on helping us with that. As I mentioned, council members are a vital part of the authority. Essentially, especially when it comes to identifying projects that will go a long way in improving residents' quality of life. Our partnership with residents and other stakeholders is also furthering our work. For example, CPD's Connected Communities Initiative leverages public-private partnerships to enhance residents' quality of life through improvements to outdoor spaces at our developments. The initiative also serves as a roadmap for dialogue and engagement with our partners. We know how important it is to engage with the residents, the development staff, the elected officials, and other members of the community in the planning, the design, and the implementation of those projects. Our goals of accountability, transparency, and increased participation with the partners uh, are supported with our new standard procedure stakeholder engagement, which rolled out with training this year. In conclusion, NYCHA strives every day to be good stewards of the funding we receive to preserve public housing and to provide a better quality of life for our residents. However, we know we need to continue to improve the timelines of city discretionary funded projects. I would like to emphasize again that NYCHA's partnership with council is crucial and we value it highly. From many meetings and conversations, I've taken your suggestions to heart and incorporated them into the way we do business. Your support and generosity are critical. We, would be able, uh, we wouldn't be able to complete many of the projects that matter most to the residents with federal funding alone. Thank you, and we are grateful for your support, and we are happy to answer any questions that you may have, and we look forward to keeping you updated on the status of the efforts to improve our developments, as well as the residents' quality of life. Thank you. Uh, we will now move to questions uh, from Chair Ampri Samuel, followed by questions from Chair Rosenthal. Thank you. Um, I just want to recognize that we've been joined by Council Member Chen as well. And we're going to do things a little different today. Um, because this is a joint hearing, I don't want to ask a bunch of questions and then get caught up and then turn around and kick it to Chair Rosenthal. And so we are going to tag team this and ask questions together. Um, it just makes sense. And I think that it'll, we'll have a better conversation and the discussion should flow a lot better um, with the both of us asking questions. Um, and so I'll start with historically, NYCHA has had a significantly lower city capital commitment rate when compared to the citywide average. For instance, in fiscal 2021, NYCHA had actual commitments of approximately $103.1 million against a plan of $1.6 billion, or 6.4% of the total planned commitments. The citywide commitment rate for fiscal 2021 was approximately 61.7%. So that's 61.7% compared to NYCHA's 6.4%. And this reminds me of what Karen Blondell said, right? We have money, but not spending the money. And so what metrics are used to track NYCHA's spending of city capital dollars? And can you explain why the authority is having so much difficulty in committing its city capital funding? Thank you, Chair, for the question. Um, I'll answer it in a couple of stages. As you know, NYCHA has one of the largest capital programs in the city, and it is in a unique position with a large occupied resident portfolio and severely distressed infrastructure. This type of commitment rate comparison is not apples to apples. And NYCHA has spent considerable time collaborating with our federal oversight partners and planning on how best to leverage the capital plan to correct the deficiencies um, 
and the problems across the pillar areas of the HUD agreement. The time spent was intentional and purposeful and more important um, to us than the commitment rate because we wanted to make sure that we were spending the dollars wisely. Our capital plan, which we uh, was released in May of 2021, this is the agreement that allows us to move those funds forward. Um, and we are now, now that that agreement is hit and we have access to those funds, we're working on implementing the plan and preparing to spend this funds. Okay, so um, you just mentioned not apple to apples. Um, what are, can you just explain what are the exact challenges to spending the capital dollars and we're in that process? If you can explain to us where in that process are you experiencing the, um, the most difficulty? Um, yep. So, um, and that's when it, received, I, I get the action plans you have, but that's new and this has been an issue. And so I'm just hoping that you can mm -hmm. give us a little more detail. No, th uh, thank you very much. So although the funds come in every year and we've had three years of funding, those funds have not been accessible to us. And so, uh, it works against the commitment rate. If you have three years of funding, almost more than a half a billion dollars, I think it's around $750 million, um, then obviously your percentages don't work because you don't have access to those. This year, we uh, worked with OMB to right size our portfolio um, based against our obligations and expenditures. And those three years shift so that way we can actually spend those funds. So as soon as uh, the action plan was approved, we are able to now spend those dollars, and then we presented uh, a strategy in which we could we could spend the dollars that we're getting. Can you give us an example of something that has been stalled and the, having a conversation with OMB, and now you're ready to move forward because you addressed that specific problem? And maybe it's an example. Yeah. Yeah, it's an example from um, from the testimony this morning. I mean, the testimony earlier, maybe from. Dana Eldon with the roof repairs. Is that a good example to use? Um, I, yes, I, mean, I can give you an example of a, a, a typical uh, um, city investment versus a federal and state investment. Is that, I think, what you're asking about? Um, you know, one, I just want to say that this was an important move for us in terms of the agreement funds. Um, because we wanted to make sure that we're spending those funds accurately. And now that we have an action plan, uh, we've actually are working on accelerating a lot of the projects on waste management. In terms of our roofing program, um, our roofing program, there was a, a, a wonderful, uh, uh, there was a lot of money that was spent to the housing authority um, and we are spending those down. We're actually accelerating that program. Uh, and we've been able to work with OMB to get design fees uh, in one year and then construction fees in the following year. So that way we can continually be ahead of the game in terms of getting those roofing projects done. And in terms of the roofing program, I think that initiative was about 1.3 billion to replace around 947. The first tranche of all of those roofs uh, has been completed. The second tranche all of those roofs uh, are completed except one that is in construction. It's one of the larger of those developments. The third tranche, um, uh, we're, we're in, uh, in moving those forward um, in terms of putting those out to bid in terms of the design. And then as I mentioned, OMB is allowing us to move forward with the design so that way we can be ahead to put the projects out to bid. And this is Eva Trimble, Executive Vice President for Strategy and Innovation. I also want to um, add that, uh, and Stephen, you should you should mention specifically the status of the St. Mary's project that was raised earlier. Since that roof is in progress as well, we recognize that it's severely in need of of um, construction, and so that St. Mary's Park Houses project is proceeding. Uh, we expect construction to start in November of 2022. Uh, we're uh, waiting controller approval right now on A&E. And so things are moving to finally bring a new roof over to St. Mary's Park. But I wanna add chair to your question about uh, delays. I, I wanna 
say that the, the capital funding that's tied to the agreement, it's not stuck in any bureaucratic process delays. There's nothing specific there. It was really about a planning process to think about the significant amount of capital that we received, that we've, we've really never received a level of funding like this before, and we needed to scale up to, to prepare to spend it. And I want to set expectations that spending will um, will continue to scale up, but maybe not at the speed that you see with a typical um, other types of infrastructure construction projects from other agencies, because NYCHA does have very different uh, issues to deal with when we're talking about occupied rehab. You heard about stakeholder engagement as a key part of what we want to do. We've heard from residents that they want to say in the capital project development. And so we are looking to engage residents in that capital planning process. And that takes time, but that's not actual capital spending, but it's an important part of our capital project. And that's why we don't look necessarily directly at spending as a metric of how we're doing. We look at our planning process, our engagement process and other factors. Okay, well, let me just, I'm a, I appreciate that Eva. Um, and I just wanna just, just put a pin right there um, and just let my chair, my, my co-chair know that whenever you wanna jump in, you totally can because we're, I already know that we've had private conversations about this, Chair Rosenthal, and so you can um, definitely jump in. But the reason why I mentioned, um, can you give us an example, is because I really wanted to get a sense of what went wrong before. Give us an example of the work that you're doing with OMB so that you don't have those same challenges. You can move forward with spending. And if you're saying it's not necessarily about spending, it's about having a conversation. I, I need to understand what that means because when we're looking at a commitment, a, a commitment plan and a spend rate of 61% for the entire like city, but we're looking at NYCHA with a 6.4%, you know, that's six that's a significant difference. And I'm trying to understand that. And that's why I asked for an example. And when Dana Eldon spoke about the six roofs, I was hoping that you would be able to, because we talked about it, to kind of put it in, in, in the realistic term so that we can all have a like a visual right now. So that's why I asked for that specific example. And if you can't do that, I was hoping that you can just look at a different project and explain that. Because we're gonna we're gonna be here. We have a whole bunch of other questions related to yep. specific spending, but I just I was hoping to get like, you know, start this discussion with an example. Well, and I I was trying to, um, thank you. The the example that I have is that we've been working with OMB, so that way we could front those tranches with design fees, right? And then thus, when we go to construction, we're that much further rather than a cold start when those fundings come to us directly. So usually it's- what, What's really confusing about that is that always was possible. What What's changed? You could have always, five years ago, you could have done the same thing where you plan a year ahead and go to OMB. What, what magic has changed now? Um, and I asked because when Chair Sam, Ampre Samuel asked this question before, I, I did not understand one word of the answer and I, I, it is genuinely gobbledygook to me. What I see is a historic situation. His, all the years that you've had to do this right, all the years that you've gotten, maybe a million is different than 200 million, but even when you got a million dollars from the city, you didn't spend it. Oh, am I, I should be saying billions, right? My bad. It wasn't spent. So, so what is it about the, uh, I guess, federal monitor who came in that has changed this so significantly? And I, I, uh, the only answer I can come up with, and I'm eager to hear from you, is that you need more staff to meet demand, right? We're a big city. So in a way, you can't, you should try to not listen to dollar amounts. They're all going to sound big, right? We're, we're just a big city. I mean, 
you know, one should think about it, okay, let's say we were a smaller city, we would get less money, right? So the quantity sort of doesn't matter. The question is, why can't you execute? And why couldn't you execute five years ago? And the only answer I can think of is because you don't have enough staff. And if that's the answer, then I'm curious why you don't, given that the staff in this division is paid for, right? Through bonding, right? So, and I, I know that in 2018, someone pointed this out to NYCHA, and I know that starting in 2018, you indeed started bonding for these costs, which is great. Sorry you didn't do it earlier. Other eight, you know, I don't even know how to grapple with that. But given the fact that you now know you can, why not just hire twice as many people? You know what the process is. You know it takes a long time. This is not rocket science. I, I really wouldn't ask you to endeavor to explain what's changed with the monitor that has made some sort of difference. So magically a year from now, there won't be a hearing like this because you've spent 100% of your city money. Um, I don't understand. I really don't understand your answer. Yeah, so far. Thank you. Sure, thank you. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if my answer or Stephen's answer wasn't wasn't clear, but I, I can't say what we were doing wrong five years ago. I can say that we we take responsibility for slow spending on our capital plan. However, we have been focused now on how we change that and how we accelerate spending, but also how we best plan for our capital program. And a lot of capital, a lot of the, the focus of capital is about long-term planning. How do we choose our projects that we're going that we're going to invest in? And where do we invest? I, I do think one of the advantages of the HUD agreement was that focus on the pillar areas, heat and elevators, lead and mold. And that provided us some focus to say, how do we use our capital specifically to address those deficiencies in those areas? I guess what I'm saying is that's your job. Yes. And we're saying we are doing you're, it, doing, you're doing it now, I think better than we have ever done before and are prepared to spend a, the largest capital program we have ever had here at NYCHA. You know what? So, so, so with that being said, right, um, let's jump into that, right? Um, according to your website, the Capital Projects Division is responsible for over $1 billion in construction projects funded by the federal, state, and city investments. Can you describe in detail CPD's role in managing the funds received across the three levels of government? I think if you could like start to outline that, it'll help us to to further the conversation. Yes, thank you. So Capital Projects Division, CPD, is responsible for the planning and implementation of you know, the capital construction projects undertaken by NYCHA across all, all sources of funding. And this starts out with the planning in the anticipation of the funds that are gonna get received, as well as the comprehensive physical needs assessment process to really support data-driven decision-making and then the dialogues that happen uh, in order to build out a five-year capital plan. Once the funds are received and then allocated to CPD, the project's uh, planning uh, begins in which staff are assigned and schedules are developed and the project is outlined. Um, typically, CPD's engagement with numerous stakeholders begins at that moment in time. Um, okay, all right. For the people in the back, you have the physical needs assessment, right? And that's what that that's 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 what you need across the board. And then you get funding based on what's listed in the physical needs assessment, right? And when you get funding, 
Is the funding attached to a certain part of the physical needs assessment or is it just you receive money into NYCHA CPD based on the physical needs assessment and then you then determine who does what? So I'm just trying to get a picture yep. of that. So simple you, business, that's what you can say it. Yep, um, it depends on the type of funding source. The okay. city funded sources are allocated so they come to us as a scoped project and a project. So, you know, we appreciate all of the discretionary funds from the council members and the borough presidents. Those come in as a specific project to us uh, through um, the, the city system. And then there are the mayoral pieces, which a lot of them are allocated directly to something, a roof, um, a heating plant at a particular development, Many of those lists are generated based on the physical needs of that plant, right? So there is a laundry list of uh, levels of heating plants, roofs, uh, fives, fours, threes, twos, and ones, and uh, those funds are allocated. State funds, we work with the state in order to address certain pipelines uh, that they've allocated to us, and those, again, are allocated at a particular development and a particular funding source. And then the federal five-year, uh, the federal five-year capital plan we use in order to leverage some of those pieces. Right now, 90% of that federal plan is dedicated to areas within the pillar. So the heating plants, uh, additional funding to the roofs, that, that federal dollars are also helped to support some of the, the city projects in which have uh, capital eligibility issues where we support those as well. Did that, I hope that answered your question in terms of city and state are allocated to a particular development and a particular unit and federal, uh, a five-year capital plan is developed out. So um, is CPD able to match funding with projects that will make the most efficient use of the funds? Um, yeah, that or because I know you mentioned yeah. like specific. Yep, projects. and and we leverage funds all the time to make projects whole. How? So I'll give an example of the the City Plus heating plant program. So this was a generous gift in terms of the the funds to come in and and do city heating plants. Um, many of the items within a heating plant program are not capital eligible, like the temporary boilers. So we leverage federal dollars against those city dollars. So that way we can actually have a temporary boiler when we're putting in the heating plant or remove electrical, some other items that are not capital eligible. At the same time period, we might leverage, in this case, we leverage EPC funds to help with temperature sensors. So that way our heating plants are running at their optimum. We also used federal dollars where we had some steam distribution issues uh, of the underground steam distributions. And so we were able to leverage some of the federal dollars to fix the steam underground uh, distribution. So in whole, we tried to create a holistic project, not just from one funding source. The roofing is another good example of that. Most of the time that we're doing roofing, we wanna take care of the brickwork as well because we don't wanna damage the asset of the roof while we're doing the local law 11 work. And so we will use some of the federal funds against the local ones because facade work is not capital eligible. And so we'll do some of the local law 11 work with our federal dollars. So that way we can make sure that the asset of the roof and the, and the brickwork are taken together. There's lots and lots of examples, but the capital is constantly leveraging funds in order to make complete projects. You know, I understand what you're saying. And, and yes, there's complexity there. So, but it also, you can plan for it. So you can plan that you're going to use the city dollars in one way and the federal dollars in another way. And for the city dollars, simply start planning for that six months earlier or whatever. So everything can be in sync and done expeditiously. Right? I agree. In fact, uh, just this last couple of years, we've looked at this portfolio as an all sources portfolio. And we are planning it out as one piece. Um, actually, we've done it more than the last two years. Um, the, you know, I'll just give an example on the discretionary funds. We got the list 
immediately for those discretionary funds for this year. And we immediately started to move on those in terms of writing task orders and getting those ready for their CP approval. So that way, when we receive the funds in November and we're able to move the projects forward, we already have the task orders written and that we're able to submit the CPs. And so uh, we are, we, we did that this year and we're gonna continue to do that. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right, uh, Chairwoman Rosenthal. Um, we think about this holistically as an all sources budget, and then we leverage correctly. And then with the discretionary funds where we only find out uh, at that funding year, we're, we're starting to get ahead of when the funds come in. Right, and, and do keep in mind that I've allocated money over the last eight years, as I'm sure is the case every other council member will say, and similarly only, I think it was 6% of that money had ever been spent. And this year, when we looked at it together, we realized that we would not be able to spend a lot of it. So, um, I, and, and the cost on the one project that we're gonna do has doubled. So, um, and that project had been put in the budget back in 2015. So, so it's a sad, state of affairs, I guess the the mayor's budget, when he allocates for something, it's pretty broad brush, right? So like um, 2.8 billion on one of the lines for building improvements over 10 years. So that's like a pretty fungible line item. Are you able, to use that generality to plan ahead of time? Um, I can let, uh, I'd like to pass it along to Anika, um, but in terms of the capital portfolio, um, when we talk about the mayor's funds, the, those are allocated. Um, the action plan is the ones in which there was a dollar amount that we worked diligently with the monitors team and the city to identify the funds and put them into the different pillars to move those forward and that's the uh the agreement and the action plan but let me well, pass although, it along to anika on, on the point of the action plan um you know circling back to something i mentioned in my opener the action plan calls for quarterly reporting with detailed um, great detail. Uh, it's on page 20 if anyone wants to look at the action plan. Terrific detail about what's going on with each project. And again, the first report was due October 31st. And that report, in other words, not your usual quarterly report, but you're supposed to send to the monitor this report with great detail, which would shed light on what's going on here. That's the report that I have not seen. Um, and so I don't know what's happening there at all. So you're referring to the quarterly reports. Um, all of those were submitted and- No, nope, I'm referring No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, quarterly... submitted report that is has was agreed on at on May 15th May 8th this mm -hmm. year it's the federal monitor approves NYCHA's city capital action plan uh, yes I'm sorry let me rephrase that the action plan is on the website the quarterly reports the reporting piece that you're speaking of is is what they refer to or the monitor team refers to as the quarterly report um, we have submitted those for both the GDA action plan as well as the city action plan. It doesn't um, have the detail that's required on page 20. So I don't, I was, I, you know, I'm, we're going to make sure that you have a, a copy of that. I have it. Um, um, so uh, Brian sent it along, which I appreciate. Okay. We work with the monitors team uh, on, on that report and the format of the, the report and We'd, have, we'd be happy to hear if there are other items that you would like 
again. I, I just want what's on what on page twenty. You've said that uh, you would supply. Um, I could start reading off the details, but suffice to say, they're just tracking details. A list of tracking details. Yes, and right now, many of the projects in the in the capital action plan are at very early stages, so we don't have all of that information. But we are working with the monitor team to improve our reporting um, in that quarterly report. And as the projects develop, we will have more details to share. But right now, since many of them are at the very early stages, we didn't have all of those components just yet to include in the report. Then why did you give yourself a due date of October 31st? When We when said we would provide a, a report quarterly on where we're at, and we wanted to provide something, even if it doesn't have the full level of detail as described in the action plan. To, to further explain, I think what Council Member Rosenthal is, is saying is that there's a set of milestones in there, and mm -hmm. there are milestones that we would not be hitting at this point in time, like construction completion, some of those milestones. So as the project commences, there are different milestones that we would uh, input into that list. And those milestones that are further down the processes uh, are identified, um, are, are not identified at this point in time because we wouldn't have gotten to those. Again, it includes even, there is a milestone called forecast completion. Um, and then the next milestone is delays. So if any of those projects, have they been delayed, right? That could have been reported. Look, we don't have to go back and forth, but suffice to say, the public has no idea about why this money is not being spent. And I, I, mean, I, just, I wanna just kind of put it into context for, for the public that don't know what we're talking about right now. Um, the NYCHA submitted a city capital action plan and it was approved by the federal monitor. And um, one of the requirements is for a, um, a quarterly report. And um, the previous discussion was related to um, the quarterly report that, was, that we just received a few minutes ago um, and what it did not have based on what we thought it would have that was outlined um, in the action plan. I hope I explained that to mm -hmm. those who were possibly confused. So I would encourage you to look at NYCHA's um, action plan, capital spending action plan, and then look at the monitor's um, report and NYCHA's report. Thank um, you. Yes. Thank you, Chair and Presimo. Just one clarification. Um, the capital planning team, the staff who works there, are you able to charge those costs off to debt service, to, to bonding? So I'm going to pass this on to uh, Anika to speak a little bit about the financial uh, associated to the staffing costs. Thank you. For Sure. Thank you, Steve. So the city provides financial support to pay for our capital project staff, many of the staff that work directly on projects, and that's actually done through community development block grant support. And so we are actively charging um, those staff costs where appropriate, um, and that helps us tremendously. So we appreciate that. Um, I, I'm so sorry, but I think I asked a bit, are you able... So if you're able to charge it to um, the bonding, then the cost gets uh, woven into the debt service you pay every year. Right, and so we are not charging anything to the bonding. The city has given us a different pot of funding for our CPD staff and we are charging that. So we are not charging anything to bonding currently. Okay, and so, the, and so that other pot of money comes from federal funding Correct. called CB something. <laughs> yes. And um, so have you explored the possibility um, and 
I'm sorry, but I talked to the finance, the person who was in charge of finance yesterday who said that he explored the possibility. And in fact, they had changed, NYCHA had changed. Um, I mean, of course, use federal funds for anything. That's great. But if you can, if part of the problem is not having enough staff, because it's a really big number and you have to do a lot of planning, why not use the tool? of charging off the additional staff. So I'm happy to, I'm not sure who you spoke to um, and if it was on the NYCHA side or the OMB side, but I'm happy the to- side. It was a NYCHA person who used to work at OMB. Okay, so I'm happy to have that conversation with OMB and talk it through. But as mentioned, currently we charge all of our staff, most except for really like four or five people, to the federal pot um, and that is provided to us by the city and it has been um, very instrumental into helping us get this appropriate staffing. Right. I'm happy so to look into that. If you had more staffing funded by whoever, would projects move along faster? Steve, do you wanna to talk to that? Um. I, I don't know if I would say that the projects would move along faster, but you know, as more money comes available, it would assist us with building out uh, and moving projects. Um, so more invoices, have... more project managers, more architects and engineers. Um, I will say that uh, a few years ago, um, we set up a program very similar to other agencies as we were reaching out to other agencies to, to discuss with them and see their programs and how they moved projects uh, faster so uh, we can learn program. from them. And one of the things that, that we built into our program was program managers um, using models by other agencies okay. as well as the Recover and Resiliency Program. And so we've been able to uh, forecast when we were looking at getting some of the funds and get those program managers on board that can assist us from everything from uh, IT support, resident engagement, all the way through project management, architecture and engineering and consultants. So given that the amount of money that you have to spend has increased tremendously, has OMB allotted you more fund, more staffing, money for staffing the capital planning team? Uh, we haven't been allocated uh, more money for staffing. So quick question, um, and then I know I want to, uh, We've, we have some colleagues that's had the hand raised for quite some time now, and I feel bad that Council Member Chin dropped off. Um, so it's not about the staffing. It's about the approval of the projects themselves and the planning of the projects, which, is, which causes the delay or causes a, um, a delay in projects being completed or the quote unquote spending for the project. So it's not a staffing issue, it's a, a process issue. So um, again, obviously I'm, I'm gonna concede, I, I'm gonna concede that, that yes, obviously additional staffing across the board would always help, right? Um, we, have, we have thought about this in terms of, of where we wanna be in terms of our obligations and expenditures and, and we're hiring up through our program managers, which was the, the uh, armature that we have. Um, and then I, I, I think we've, we've had these conversations uh, many, many times on, you know, capital does an amazing job of obligations and expenditures on the federal dollars. Um, we took this period of time and worked with the monitor to really think about where we need to spend the funds that we received. Um, we wanted to be good stewards. And through that, we created the action plan. Um, and you know, now that the action plan was approved, we're, e we're able to immediately start to, uh, to draw down those funds and get those projects moving forward. Those three years of funding, again, 750 million, it's more than a half a billion dollars sat on our books um, and we weren't able to, you know, to, to move those projects forward and that's gonna hurt your obligations and expenditures rate. Um, we're constantly working with our partners in order to expedite and speed up the, the processes um, and, you know, in, and in, in ways in, that we can do that to move 
uh, our capital pipeline a little bit faster. Federal and state, as you know, we don't have all of the uh, requirements associated to it as the city bonded money does. Um, and that tends to add a little bit more time to the processes. I'm not saying it's a bad process, but it adds more time. And if we look at complete city funds, uh, we're looking at about six to eight months um, in the design phase to hire an architect or engineer on board, and then in the procurement phase. So the pre-design stays about the same, the design stays about the same, we put it out to bid, that's the same, and the construction durations are the same on federal, state, and city. But through city processes, we add about six to eight months um, for approvals to get those contracts through. And if you have to do that twice, that's that adds a year into the, the overall process of the program. Which is why you start a year earlier for the city money, right? And you so know that. And let's be clear, the federal money, I mean, these past two years, and we can pass it off to COVID, these past two years in terms of your obligations and spending since 2018 have tanked. Even with federal money, you're at um, obligated, I think 37% of the funds that have been allocated by the federal government. That's the easy money to spend. And 22% you've actually spent. So this is, I mean, the city percentage is you know, negligible and that's a real problem. But I, I hope, I, I wanna pass it along to my colleagues. I just don't understand how this has been allowed to happen. Um, I'm gonna stop right there. And Audrey, I'm gonna turn it over to you because we have a lot more questions, but I wanna be mindful of my colleagues. Great, thank you. We will now turn to questions from uh, other council members, beginning with council member Grudenchik, followed by council member Brooks Powers. And again, a reminder to council members to please use the Zoom raise hand function if you have any questions. Uh, and an additional reminder that the clock will be set to five minutes in the interest of time. Thank you. Thank you. Starting time. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chairs, and thank you um, for holding this most important um, hearing on NYCHA spending. And uh, I, uh, I don't have any NYCHA properties uh, in my district in Eastern Queens, but I uh, am a, an alum of NYCHA. I grew up in Pominock houses, um, which were very, very well run. Um, complaints were answered almost overnight. Uh, and no exaggeration there. Um, when the when the steam pipe in front of my building split open and was belching steam, it wasn't fixed overnight. But I kind of remember within a month or two, uh, NYCHA came in and ripped up the ground and replaced the pipe, um, which at that point, I guess, was about 20 something years old. And things do fail. Um, having listened to this hearing uh, since it began and listening to the questions of uh, my chair, uh, Helen Rosenthal, and Chair uh, Ampre Samuel, I can tell you that I really don't have much confidence um, in what I've been hearing. And I'm, I'm sorry to hear that um, because there was a time when the New York City uh, Housing Authority was the be all and end all of public housing authorities across the nation. And I, I would like somebody, and I don't care who it is, to tell me how you are going to deal with um, this influx of federal dollars that is going to be coming our way. Um, Senator, our senators, uh, led by uh, Senate Majority Leader Schumer, uh, our congressional delegation has worked very hard. Uh, and for the first time in a very long time, public funding is going to be flowing to NYCHA. And uh, the people, the testimony that I heard from the residents at the beginning of this hearing um, was heart wrenching. And, and uh, I, I don't know what else to say. Um, when Chair Alika Sample, uh, the first, her first hearing uh, was uh, almost four years ago. And at that time we were talking about massive failures of heating plants across the city of New York during a bitterly cold winter. So um, I'd like to hear from somebody, uh, 
what is going to be different going forward? Because I don't really think that um, the two chairs who have asked questions today have really gotten their appropriate level of uh, response from NYCHA. And I, I know you go to work every day and uh, I know you're trying, but I don't know um, what it's going to take to give me the confidence. I'm leaving office at the end of this year, but I'd like to think that we left the city in a better place than we found it. And I don't believe that's going to be the case uh, for the 400,000 plus NYCHA residents, which uh, make up over 5% of the city population. So uh, I'd love to hear from anybody. Member, thank you so much for the question. And um, I really do appreciate it. Um, I think um, with all due respect, I think, you know, the time that you grew up at, in Pamanak houses, um, which uh, was always known as the crown jewel of nature. Uh, I just want and, to say something, Mr. Honan. I have spoken. Yes. It was considered a an excellent place to live and grow up. But I've spoken to my colleague, Danique Miller, who grew up in the pink houses. He had a similar experience. And I have spoken to people who grew up in NYCHA residences all across New York City in the 50s and the 60s. And their experience generally was very, very similar to what I had, um, that matters were taken care of. Um, and I, I just don't know what has happened over the last 40 years or so that uh, slowly um, this is... Yep. yep. If this was can, a can, can, uh, I'm sorry, can, I didn't mean, we I didn't mean, to, impl yep, I didn't mean to imply that Pamanak was was different. I just I wanted understand to, that. I get you that. Know, because, I just you know, that on the record. Um, Pamanak was just no different because if you speak to uh, Ms. Torres in, uh, in Smith Houses, she will tell you that years ago, Smith Houses was much better. If you speak to Ms. Eldon at St. Mary's, she will tell you that St. Mary's was run a lot better. If it worked at one time, it can work again. However, the biggest difference is more than a generation, and I would even dare to say maybe two generations of federal disinvestment, both on the operating side and on the capital side. This is not unique to NYCHA. If you talk to housing authorities in Philadelphia, if you talk to housing authorities in Chicago, if you talk to housing authorities in Los Angeles, they will tell you that they face the same struggle. Their answer to this problem was demolition. I understand in, that. In New York City, in, in New York City, we have done our best to keep um, public housing going. Um, but it I'm is sorry. really, this is an example of governments, they, they call this phrase, starving the beast. And so they starve us and they, they give us half a dinner and they say, why are you still hungry? Well, for years, we've gotten half the dinner. Right. And With yes. all due respect, um, Mr. Honan, and I have so enjoyed working with you over these eight years. You've really been incredibly responsive when I call you. With all due respect, you can say that they've only given us half a dinner, but you haven't spent that half. You haven't eaten that half. Yeah, and think... you're saying that you're hungry, but you haven't eaten that half. And so if you can't spend the money you're given, I don't know how to process you need a lot more. Of course sure. you need a lot more, but why don't you spend what you have? And that's the point of this hearing. Yep. Yep. Um, and and Council Member, I, I think I would, I, I would agree. I would, I would think almost all of nature problems are two-pronged, right? Start with the spending, start with the f fact that we are, uh, we are definitely underfunded for years. But then we do have a management problem, um, and we have for years, and we acknowledged, acknowledged it in the federal agreement that we were forced to sign with HUD, the Southern District, the City of New York. That was not just a, you know, that was, that was an admission that we have in a problem in both ways. We now at NYCHA have folks who um, have admitted to the problem and are working on a transformation plan to change the way not only that we're managed in all areas of government. And Eva is leading that effort. Um, Eva, maybe you can talk a little bit about how things are going to get different, how we're going to rate the ship. Thank you, Brian. And yes, the, the transformation plan, which is on our website, if, if you haven't yet looked at it, it was released in March 2021. It, it shows our plan to change our management and operations 
It proposes an entirely new business model for NYCHA operations. It's not going to replace the fact that we still need 40 billion, but our goal is that if we say we're gonna show up to fix the problem in your wall, we'll show up to fix the problem in your wall. The underlying cause, the broken, the broken pipe, it may still continue to leak and we may have to come back a month later to refix that wall. But the goal of the transformation plan is an entirely new business model that, that improves our response time to our residents, especially around work orders, cleanliness of buildings and grounds, really the core operational needs. And the, the focus of the HUD agreement and the six pillars, it, it shows that we it, it, it's given us this focus to improve those, those areas. So you mentioned heating. Um, our heating response time over the last few years has dramatically improved, um, less outages and less um, length of the outages. And so we are starting to turn that management around, but without the additional capital. And for many years, we were eating our entire plate of federal funds. As Steve has mentioned, the city funds have grown substantially over the, the most recent years. But for many, many years, our capital program was almost entirely federally based. And we did, we did meet all of those federal requirements on spending guidelines. So we have done our best, but it, you know, when a building doesn't receive capitalization, when it's the same built, when the same boiler, same pipes that you grew up with 40 years ago, there's very little we can do to substantially change the living conditions for our residents. Just jumping in real quick, um, I heard Brian say that um, there was a, a you know a management problem, and mm -hmm. then um, Eva, you talked about, and, and then Brian also mentioned the transformation plan. Then Eva jumped in with the transformation plan. Um, can you talk specifically about the change in management real quick? Like what, what changes were made and made, like knowing that there's a management problem, sign the federal agreement that a federal agreement that there's a management problem. Explain to me what changes were made with management. Thank you, chairs. So um, starting with, with our chair, Chair Russ was brought in. Um, he has more federal housing, public housing experience than any previous chair. And he is he, working with him. We have restructured the management of of our property management operations. So we instituted something called the neighborhood model, which re reassigns our properties into smaller management clusters called neighborhoods. And this allows management to have eyes on the ground and really see what's going on with our properties at all time. Our property managers need a lot of support and a lot of help. The conditions in our building are such that they're constantly putting out fires. They're constantly responding to problems and they need support. And, we want to better connect the, the properties with central office so that there's the same sense of urgency that people at our, pro the workers at our properties feel that our central office has to feel as well. So everything at NYCHA is being redesigned around these neighborhoods to provide our property managers support in serving our residents. And, so we, and we now have changes, 30 neighborhoods to serve our residents. What changes were made in, in management to spend the money? So within central office, what changes were made to expedite procurement? We brought on a chief procurement officer. Uh, I think he started about a year ago and he has completely um, streamlined our, our, our procurement pro policies. We instituted a new procurement policies manual last year. Um, he is also engaging with the supply chain in a whole new way. So we've been meeting with the New York Building Congress we understand that our capital program specifically is, is resource intensive. The amount of boilers, the amount of elevators that we're gonna need requires us to reach out to that supply chain in a whole new way. So our, we have a new chief procurement officer that's dealing with those, those big supply chain and capital issues, but down to the micro purchase issue as well. We have a new purchasing and logistics department that's focused on helping property managers quickly access the contracts they need to respond when conditions at the sites demand, whether it's um, a stoppage and they need plumbers, whether they need uh, tree removal after there, a storm. Is there, thank you for that and apologies for the motorcycle outside my office door, but do you have documentation of that? Because the documentation we're looking at shows a decrease in spending of federal, state and city money. So what you're saying really sounds rosy. Do you have any document that can show that? What is your new streamlined procurement mechanism? 
you know, uh, and you I can guess. send those over. I'm not expecting you to rattle it off the top of your yeah. head. <laughs> I will, I will talk is, to the team and see what we can share. Hard, but the disconnect between what you're saying and what I'm seeing in my deteriorating developments is large. Yeah, I'm not sure what you're seeing, but we are spending faster than we can get from the federal government. We are spending every dollar we get. To right. try I, to look forward, I look forward to seeing that documentation. Audrey. Great, thank you. Uh, we will now continue with questions from Council Member Brooks Powers, followed by Council Member Salamanca. And uh, before we proceed, I would just like to um, make a quick announcement uh, to the residents and other members of the public who have joined us today. We thank you very much for taking the time to come and present before the committees. Uh, and we thank you also for your patience. Uh, for those who haven't yet had a chance to speak, we will hear from all of you as soon as the committee members conclude their questions with, with the administration. Council Member Brooks Powers. Starting time. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to both Chairs Rosenthal and Anthony Samuels for convening this much needed and timely hearing today. Thank you to the members of the administration who come to provide testimony today. As a member of the Capitol Subcommittee and as a council member, who represents five NYCHA developments and a RAD development in my district. It's a priority that we ensure that NYCHA is using its capital dollars responsibly. So I look forward to hearing about how the department is working to improve long-term quality of life conditions for the residents of our city's public housing. The main concern I would like to address today is how NYCHA is using capital funding to maintain the central services of its building stock. Particularly as one of the residents earlier mentioned, the weather is getting colder and it's especially critical that NYCHA keep its facility heating equipment functioning so that our public housing residents are not left susceptible to electrical outages or cold apartments. In recent weeks, as the weather has gotten colder, my office has received reports of inactive or malfunctioning heating systems in multiple, in multiple NYCHA facilities. In that light, I wanted to ask NYCHA representatives some questions, but before I go there, I also wanna take a moment to read um, an email I received in my office from a Redfern resident um, that is requesting attention to their matter. Um, and I won't read the whole thing in, in interest of time, but it says tickets are open and closed. NYCHA no longer has the responsibility and National Grid doesn't care. There are no trained workers on site. ESD is attempting to resolve residents total discomfort. 88 year old seniors are on oxygen, defibrillators and have asthma calling in desperate need of help. So now I go to the questions. How many complaints has NYCHA received regarding malfunctioning heat systems, malfunctioning elevators? How has NYCHA been following up to ensure that building systems are functional and outages are kept to a minimum? Under the HUD agreement, NYCHA must replace 297 boilers by the end of 2026. Can NYCHA provide a list of all developments citywide that currently do not have permanent boilers installed? How is NYCHA prioritizing facilities for replacement and identifying buildings whose residents have the highest need? And in the week, wake of Hurricane Sandy, NYCHA received funding for infrastructure improvements and repairs. How has that funding been used in the years since to protect NYCHA developments from future storm damage? And just to be a bit specific, um, to represent my district on these questions also, the boiler um, question, at Brian, as you know, uh, we communicated all through the weekend because I had residents in Redfern with absolutely no heat. And then in terms of the infrastructure, Oceanside Houses um, has a, 
a lot of concerns as well as Beach 41st and Redfern in terms of commitments that have been made to NYCHA to those developments in terms of the, the her, Superstorm Sandy monies that NYCHA received and the repairs that have not happened as it pertains to their elevators um, and their heating system. So I, I'd like to hear um, responses from NYCHA on this. Thank you. Sure, thank you for that. I can start and then hand it off or my colleagues can jump in. Uh, I wanted to start with your, your heating issues. Um, the HUD agreement sets requirements for how we respond to, to heat complaints. And in anticipation of heat season and in order to get ahead of those, those performance metrics, the NYCHA heat team does tremendous preventative maintenance. We go through all of our, our heating plants and we, we do um, check throughs of all the boilers. We look for parts. We start stocking the parts that we know fail like coils and other things in our, in our heating plants that we, we know we wanna have at the ready at our most uh, distressed sites. We also instituted a few years ago, a new heat desk that's stationed in Long Island City that tracks all the heat complaints coming in so we can faster respond just by seeing um, increases in complaints. Uh, we dispatch our heat teams right away. We also have um, building oh, sensors fine. in many properties now that start to show when, when temperatures are falling as well as um, certain alarms on boilers when we can start to predict that things are failing on the heating plant prior to even getting complaints. So we've really changed the way we're, we're using data better to respond to heating complaints. Um, I, you know, if you're having specific heating outages, definitely, you know, we can coordinate with Brian to follow up on those constituent issues. We also report all of our outage information on our website and you can see all of the current um, heating, heating outages, water outages, everything is transparent on our website as we're experiencing them. I can hand it off to Steve to talk about some of the replacement schedules that I think you mentioned. And if I think, and there was a lot in your question. So if I missed something, please let me know. Okay, and before we um, pass the, the question over to your colleague, um, when you say that you're using data better, I would imagine that if you're seeing it ahead of time that we wouldn't necessarily get as many complaints as we're getting in terms of the lack of heat. So is this something that has been implemented throughout um, all of the developments? Is it a pilot program? Um, because it's throughout all the developments and we still want the complaints. That mm -hmm. information is really important to us. We encourage residents that are facing any type of complaint in their issue to put in that, that work ticket so that we know about it and we can follow up on it. We don't see work tickets as a bad thing. It gives us feedback on our buildings and what our residents are experiencing. So, you know, if everyone in the building is calling in the heat complaint, that's fine. Um, and that gives us information to work off of. Um, I'll I'll take I'll take the next um, set of questions, and mm -hmm. these are in regards to the FEMA funded projects. Um, you do have uh, five projects, I believe, in your district. Um, all of them are in construction, uh, as we are working on different scopes of generators, heating plants. Um, as part of the Steve, FEMA can fund. Can you identify which one so that I'm on the same page as you when yep. you say there are five so, in my district? Yep. So uh, you have Redfern, um, which is estimated to be completed in 2022, uh, quarter two. You have Beach 41 that's in construction as well. Um, and that should be ending its construction in quarter one of 2022. Uh, Ocean Bay or Oceanside. Uh, that construction had started uh, and it's anticipated to be completed in quarter four of 2021. Uh, Carlton Manor is also in construction and that's estimated to be completed in quarter two of 22, as well as Hamill, uh, which is estimated completed in quarter, uh, quarter two of 2023. And um, I also want to thank you very much for the, the funds that you've, you've provided us at Redfern and Carleton Manor. Um, both of those projects, the, the playground and the basketball renovations are in construction as well. And, and I thank you for your support. Steve, can you briefly um, describe the work that's being done in each of those de developments or at least, you, we, can send, yeah, at least mm -hmm. we can send the council member 
uh, a list, but if you could just briefly go into it and then we can, and then I think we should set up something with the TA leaders and the council member. So this way we're clear in all the work that needs to be done. We could set that up quickly. Yeah, I, I, in the in the matter of time, I think if if what we can do is we'll set up a meeting and we'll go through all of the scope of the work for all of those developments with you, as well as the residents. Can you just give me high level to let me know if it's pertaining to the elevators um, as yeah. indicated? I just the heating plan. Wait, just hold on for a second. Um, when Councilmember Brooks asked the question and then you answered, I had my mic off and I was saying, I wish he would just give us some details. There's only five developments. And then Brian, you jumped in and asked them to give the examples. So I appreciate that because this would help us, right? Because just listing the projects and when they're going to be completed, I can read that on the paper, you know, just to get a sense of what you're doing in a timeline is why we're having this hearing. So, Chair, sure, I've, I've worked with yeah. you for a little while, so I know what you're looking for. <laughs> so, Red Fern, you read my list. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> um, so, Red Fern, uh, we are putting in a heating plant there. Uh, it is above grade um, as as part of that program, and and there is some generators associated to that. Um, you have uh, Ocean Bay, Ocean Side, um, where we are also, we've completed with the above grade heating plant at that, that particular development. There was um, some uh, heating uh, elements associated to the hot water program to that. Carlton Manor was also above grade heating plant. Um, and that is in construction uh, as well as Hamill has an above grade heating plant. And those are the construction projects where we are fully building out a new heating plant. Uh, those are all steam programs. And then we've decoupled in terms of, we are, we are uh, heating up the hot water through steam from those boiler plants. So um, no elevators are listed in any of those capital projects? Um, not, uh, there are, there are, there's a number of other pieces, elevators in particular ones, but there's the lighting and the site plans. Um, in terms of elevators, uh, there are no elevators as part of the recovery and resiliency program at those developments. So there was a commitment from NYCHA um, on elevators. <laughs> Um, to Redfern and Beach 41st houses. So I'd like to know how that fell off the table and how could a commitment made be changed? Um, I will look into those particular ones and we will get back to you um, and we'll work out um, to make sure that, that the elevators are, you know, that, that we have it in our pipeline. And one okay. last thing, and um, chairs, I appreciate the time that you're providing to me. Um, but in terms of the complaints that we've been receiving in terms of the malfunctioning heating systems and elevators, I request that NYCHA provide in writing to the committee members um, a full reporting on um, how many of these are in um, in bad shape in terms of the reports of the outages um, so that we have a good line of sight on that. Um, also, again, Redfern continues to be without heat. And as you all are working towards this um, construction, I need to know, NYCHA has, as I'm hearing today, money that's not even being spent. Like what is NYCHA doing to address it on the short term and then long term, uh, we understand, but on the short term to make sure that we are providing New Yorkers with the heat that they need. Uh, we should not have seniors and, and families without heat. Like when we go to sleep at night, we are blessed and fortunate to, to have what I hope is a place with heat. And I have hundreds of residents that for several days when it was extremely cold and we are on our peninsula. So when it's cold in New York City, we are about 10 degrees less than y'all and they are mm. cold. And, you know, NYCHA is not doing 
what they need to do um, to ensure that they have proper heating. So, so Kenta Weber, um, it was, um, you know, all weekend long, I, I know we were in communication on the, on, the, on the heating issue at Redfern and we have had staff there today. There was a part that was uh, that's missing. It's a fairly new system too at Redfern um, too. So um, it was unusual. It did require a partnership with National Grid. So you're, as, as always, the uh, residents know what's going on. Um, and, um, but that problem should be, you know, we should be seeing improvement uh, at Redfern by, you know, by the end of this week and we'll continue to monitor and please, as always, whether it's 11 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock in the morning, you could always reach out to me and I will make sure that the heating team knows in real time. Um, and so, uh, and we can get you the number of, you know, outages so far in your developments um, for this heating season. And if the chair wants that for all committee members, we can do that too as well. Thank you so much, Brian. And this evening we have a tenants meeting with Redfern. If you or someone from NYCHA is available to join us at 6 p.m., you are more than welcome because I'm gonna have to respond for NYCHA and I would love it if NYCHA can respond for NYCHA. And thank you so much chairs for the time. Great, thanks very much. We will now take questions from Council Member Salamanca, followed by Council Member Adams. Mark is ready. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for this um, important hearing on, on Capitol. Um, <clears throat> I just have a very basic question to, uh, to the Capitol team here at NYCHA. In 2017, I, at my office allocated um, about $3 million, Capitol dollars, for security upgrades to Merrill's houses. That work has still not gotten done. Can you please give me an update as to what's happening with that funding that I gave you in fiscal year 2017? Thank you, Council Member Salamanca. Um, so the three, the 3.4 for CTV upgrades at Melrose, that was, uh, we received that in fiscal year 2019. Um, and that was procured. There is a contractor that has been procured. It is now going to OMB. Uh, that's a CMA jock, and it should go into construction as soon as we have controller registration for that uh -huh. contract. Okay, let, let's go back. That funding was given to you in fiscal year 17. You're saying fiscal year 19. So did you get to it in fiscal year 19? Because it was not um, 19, it was fiscal year yeah. 17. I'm, I'm going by our the city uh, FMS system, um, and the FMS system identified that that fiscal came from 2019. Uh, it's mayoral commitments. It's for three three million four hundred forty two thousand, and those are the CCTV upgrades at Melrose. But again, I think the those the, that is irrelevant. We need to get the CCTV to the residents, and we've hired a contractor. Uh, that is going through the OMB comptroller process. And uh, as soon as we have a contract registration on that, we will start installing cameras. When was it, when was it, when was it sent to the comptroller's office? We just got the contractor. That package is getting put together. It will go to the comptroller's office or OMB. It'll go to OMB first. It has to go to the CP process first. And once we get a CP, then we can go to the comptroller's office. How long is that process gonna take? Um, it, it, it depends. Uh, we average out. Uh, we hope that that's a 30 day to 60 day turnaround, um, but we recognize with our partners that there is a lot of work. And right now it's been taking six to eight months. This is why, and I'm going to say this on a record, while I'm staying in office, while I'm still the council member, I will never allocate funding to NYCHA. It is a waste of time, you know, to be able to give you funding. And that funding was allocated in, 20, in, in, in fiscal year 17. I understand you're saying your record say fiscal year 19, but it was in, 20, in, in fiscal year 17. You know, for this entire, the entirety of the time, this money has been sitting on your lap and you have done nothing with this funding. And time in and time again, all I've heard was excuses. We've had many oversight hearings. I've asked about that money. 
you said oh, you're going to get back to me. This is the first time that I hear you getting back to me on the record. So, Madam Chair, I want to thank you for this hearing. And so, so we can really call out the incompetence when it comes to capital dollars at NYCHA. And with that, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, can I actually just follow up um, on Councilmember Salamanca's question? So let's say he put the money, some money in 17, let's say it was fully funded in 2019, whatever. So this is actually 2019. Why didn't, the process, why didn't the process start in 2019 then? Um, I can't speak to the 2019, but what I can speak to you is what we're doing right now. Can anyone um, speak I, to why it didn't happen in 2019? And again, the reason I'm focusing is because I've now taken out $3 million from my NYCHA allocations um, because they're just not, nothing, I can't seem to allocate to anything that would actually finish. Um, and so I'm now using the money to build a better lunchroom for the school next to the NYCHA development. And I feel that's a, a good use of the money and it's gonna be completed this year. It was sitting in my budget, your budget, for eight years, right? Seven, six, five, whatever it was. So I'm really curious if anyone has the answer to council member Salamanca's question, what happened between 2019 and your sudden interest in putting through the CP to OMB? And I know the answer, the sudden interest is because, you know, we wanna get stuff done by the end of people's terms or the de Blasio administration, but does anyone know why it didn't get done for two years? What I've done is a deep dive into our capital program. And we've put into place pieces in which funding when we receive it immediately goes into task orders and we start moving it through the process. I don't want projects to sit in planning. And that's, and that's what we did with our FY22. Those projects immediately, as soon as we got the list, we went into um, putting in task orders. So that way, as soon as the funding gets released and we can submit CPs in November, uh, we are doing that. Um, we're also moving a lot of projects like the CCTV over to uh, CMA and job order contract. So that way we can expedite those faster uh, than putting them, basically taking out a design phase. So the answer here is you're gonna do better because you now have this task order process that you didn't have before, right? That's what you're saying? I can't speak to the past. You're gonna do different. You're gonna do something different. But we're doing it different, different to make it better, process. so that way we never have these so, again. So, question: When you earlier we talked about um, OMB, right? The the communications you've been having with OMB, and how because of that, um, you were able to um, to shorten the, the 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 time frame of projects. So the conversations you had with OMB was um, Councilmember Salamanca's project included in that, in that OMB conversation? So we're constantly having conversations with OMB um, and trying to streamline the way in which we move our projects through the processes. Um, also with making sure that there's uh, scoping and financing and the right information in the CPs. So that way there's no back and forth. We wanna streamline this so that way it gets to them they look at it, they can approve it and move forward. And that's the goal. And it's about a partnership. It's about a partnership with OMB. It's about a partnership with Comptroller. We were able to, with the Comptroller's assistance, move everything from electronic filing. That I think is really gonna speed up the process by which we get our projects um, uh, registered. And so those are those conversations that we have regularly. Mm -hmm. You know, I I that is because the first question that I asked where I started out historically, NYCHA has had significantly lower city capital rate when compared to, the, that was my first question. 
And in that question, we asked specifically about your, your partnership and communication with OMB. And you responded by saying that you were doing something different with OMB, which is allowing for us to now see a different spin rate. And so that's why I was just, so I was thinking that since you just spoke to Councilmember Salamanca about OMB, I was trying to, you know, kind of bring us back to the first question yeah. to see if there's been a change, but. No, I, I don't want, I don't want you to. You know, OMB is not about our commitment rate. Our commitment rate is our commitment rate, right? It's our responsibility to give yeah, us process. commitment. And so the the process that I was speaking for before was the right sizing of the of the portfolio. So that way, as we look at our percentages, you have a, a quarter of a billion, uh, I'm sorry, you have $750 million that you can't access. You do that as a percentage off of your obligation and expenditure rate because you're not you're not able to have that, that's just sitting there. Um, that distorts that percentage rate. Now that we've right-sized our portfolio, as soon as we got those funds, you know, as soon as we got that agreement and those funds were available to us, we started moving on those projects and then working with OMB to illustrate where we're gonna project out for the entire year. So again, it's not OMB that's controlling our obligations and expenditures, that's us, that's me. But um, so, we're working with OMB so that way we can speed up processes. Yeah, I guess I still don't understand the difference and I still don't understand. Anyway, we should let Councilmember Adams speak, but this um, and maybe we can just work offline, but I genuinely don't understand what has changed and why it couldn't change two years ago, five years ago. And maybe the question is, and I get back to this, you're under oath. My question to you is, do you need more staff to get the work done? So we have a, a program set up that we can use program managers through our federal dollars to allow us to expand and to contract staff as needed for those projects. And the tool that we're using is those program managers to staff up to get these projects uh, executed. Honestly, I don't understand what you- We can always use more staff. I mean, we can always use more staff, but if, if there's not, you know, if there's not blood in the turnip to, to allow for funding to get us more staff, we're also looking at different ways in which we can make sure that we have enough staff to execute all of these projects. Right, but you don't have enough staff to execute all these projects. It's not on you. It's not on your anyone there, but you, you just don't, right? So again, apologies, Council Member Adams. I see your hand's been up for a long time. Talk is ready. Thank you so much. Um, thank you both of, of my chairs um, for having this hearing today. It's so needed. Uh, I've, I've been listening for a while. And um, I'm just going to preface this by saying that when I ran for city council um, in 2017, I promised my constituents at South Jamaica Houses that I would revamp the look for their senior center that's been out of commission for a very long time at the hands of this administration. Um, fast forward to a couple of months into office when I brought this project to NYCHA. NYCHA then handed me a $5 million bill and said, you do it yourself. Well, anybody that knows how city council is managed knows that that is our entire budget uh, for our entire district. So that was an impossibility. So there I was with egg on my face. Uh, running on something that I thought was going to be a no brainer because we care about our constituents at NYCHA. We care about the residents and most importantly, we care about our seniors, but this was not the case. I am happy to say that I have been able to secure funding over a million dollars uh, with NYCHA to, to upgrade our, our, uh, our community center for our children, partnering with Cornerstone and that has gone very, very well. So I, I wanted to say all that as far as history was concerned, commiserate with my colleague, um, Council Member Salamanca. This is such a, a difficult uh, hill to climb with NYCHA. And, I, and, and also with my, my, my colleague, uh, Council Member Gredenchik, it's very painful to have these, uh, to hear 
what is still going on to the most disenfranchised of our entire population. These are human beings and the stories that I hear every day, they're just not treated as such. I have one question after all of that. At South Jamaica Houses, I have noticed that there is storage being used uh, where children should be playing in their community center areas and certain community center. There is actual storage that is being there. There's refrigerators uh, put in there. There are other, other things that I guess maintenance is holding on to to move into apartments that need those appliances. Why would this ever be the case that we would take away space for our children and our seniors in our housing developments that they need so much, especially in the time of a pandemic? Why would these vital spaces be used for storage? I don't remember, is, is that um, storage um, in the community center? Yeah, uh, it is a family, it's called the family center. I've, in the I've, family I've, center? Yes. Yes, yeah, I apologize for not having the answer now, but I, I will make a commitment to get back to you tomorrow to find out exactly what's going on there and, you know, work with leadership here to see if we can resolve that quickly. Um, as far as funding the senior centers and community centers, um, we agree with you. The federal government in going all the way back to the Bush administration, the second George Bush, um, stopped funding um, community and senior centers, um, you know, so um, at that time, NYCHA tried its best to keep the community centers going with NYCHA staff. Eventually, it became too burdensome, and we, um, with DYCD and the city's help, we were able to have Cornerstone. But if you talk to, you know, many of the long-term residents here years ago, they will tell you when NYCHA, you know, was funded fully, you know, with community centers, not only were the conditions better, but also the relationship was much better too. People tell me who, you know, grew up was like that community center was not only where I went to summer camp, not only where I went to after school, but it was a place that I felt like family and it was a lot different. Um, it is a shame because- I hear the same stories, Brian. I, I hear the same stories of days gone yeah. by and how great the times were then. Uh, my issue, just like Barry's, just like, you know, um, Councilmember Salamanca is um, that we have gotten so far away from humanity when it comes to NYCHA and the residents of NYCHA. Again, these are human beings. And for me, all of the bureaucracy and red tape that this city puts them through is inexcusable and yes. it's heartbreaking. I, I wish uh, when I go to developments, I, I wish I could, I could say, you know, different, but I, I just do think that public housing nationally has been neglected for, for way too long and the camel's back broke. You know. Thank you. Thank you, chairs. Thank you very much, council member Adams. Uh, if there are no other council members who have questions at this time, um, we will turn back to the chairs for additional questions. So I, I want to be able to, um, to uh, I'm going to go back to Councilmember Salamanca's question, but, um, but just for the record, dive into the discretionary city capital additions. The fiscal 2021 adopted budget added about 16.1 million in city capital funds for 51 discretionary projects citywide within NYCHA's city capital portfolio. In fiscal 2021, city council discretionary projects in NYCHA's portfolio received an average of about $315,000 in funding to address physical improvements at development citywide. How much of the 16.1 million in city capital funding has been committed and of the 51 discretionary projects, how many of those projects are completed or expected to be completed in fiscal 2022? Because Stephen, you, you, you mentioned it a few times as you're working on projections with OMB. So like, if you can just kind of give us a sense overall. Well, first of all, I wanna thank you again for your support on the important projects. They contribute a lot towards, they contribute tremendous amounts to the quality of life. Um, so of the 51, the, the 16.1 million, uh, 11 million of that is in design. So 20 projects uh, total are in design. One is actually completed and being closed out. And um, 
and we are moving, there's about two that are, two or three that are being combined with borough, borough president money or it's borough, so that there is one project. So those projects are actually in design. Um, and so we've moved all of those, but none of them are obligated at this, this point in time. Because that, that's, the, they're not obligated until they have a, a contract registration. Okay. And so based on what we were just talking about, what's that timeline for some of them? Or is there, can you give us an average timeline for getting to that next step? Yep. So five of those are, are security projects, right? We can immediately move those into CMA and JOC, and that's what we've done. So those are getting CPs to immediately go out to the residents. Uh, and security and the development staff to identify where those lighting pieces are. Nine of those are grounds. Um, we're trying to move those also into a CMA and JOC contract so we can immediately go into design with the residents and skip uh, the design program. Um, three of Would those are- Is that the six month skip or? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's we're trying to skip actually a CP process, right? Because we're gonna go right into CMA and job order contract. So we get to skip the design CP phase. So we save time in, in that as well as uh, a project for design is anywhere from six to nine months. We're being able to skip that because of the type of project. There's, um, so those are immediately going. The community centers, those are all in CPs and those are all uh, over to OMB to start the design process on those. Those are CPs for design. And then there were three compactor projects. Um, as I mentioned, we completed one of those um, uh, projects. We've already moved that forward. Chair Rosenthal, I try to take notes. You can yeah, um, I appreciate that. I, I think we've asked a lot of questions. And I think my takeaway thought is that there's a November plan that the mayor is about to give to the city council to vote on. And I hope I see in there the necessary staff, um, additional staff that NYCHA needs for the capital um, plan team because we're beyond a crisis and um, Uh, the sooner we can get all these projects moved through and, you know, the money spent, um, I think that would be a good idea. But um, Chair Ambry Samuel, I admire your work with NYCHA month after month at these hearings. Thank um, you. So um, I just want to get a couple of questions in for the record that I think would be helpful um, to my colleagues come January. As part of a budget agreement reached between the mayor and the city council, the fiscal 2021 adopted budget redirected approximately 537 million from NYPD's capital budget to NYCHA to expand broadband to the community centers. In total, 157 million is expected to be invested for broadband expansion in fiscal 2021. What is the current status of the broadband expansion initiative? and how much of the 157 million has been spent to date? Thank you, council member. NYCHA is partnering with MOCTO to implement their RFP for broadband services, which includes reviewing respondents to the RFP work stream for the use of the city capital funding to expand broadband infrastructure. MOCTO is the lead agency and can provide more detailed information on the status of the project. Okay. Um, and even though they're the lead agency, they're going into I'm, your- I'm business. sorry, what agency, MACTO? The, the Mayor's Office for Chief Technology Officer. Sorry for use of the acronym. No, that's all right. So you're not in touch with them, so you don't know- the No, we are touch. in touch. We are partnering, but they are the lead agency controlling the city capital funding. We no, are reviewing- But I think the question was, given that you're in close contact with them, working with them, what's the timing on spending the money 
That's really a question for them to answer. Why? The way we partner with them is that there are respondents to the RFP, some that are using NYCHA and some that aren't. That RFP and that city capital is for citywide assets. So not every respondent to the RFP is proposing the use of NYCHA assets or to serve NYCHA residents. So when there is a respondent that includes NYCHA in their response, they have shared that with us and we are working closely with them to review those responses. I mean, do I, I don't feel the fire in your belly to get that done. We are, we've been working closely with Moncto for over a year now, uh, starting with the RFEI that they put out, I want to say June 2020, where we have six vendors on board right now installing broadband, each across three different developments. So we are instituting the biggest broadband program that NYCHA has ever been involved in through those six vendors in partnership with Mocto. And we've been very committed to expanding broadband access. We've been sharing information about the federal EBB program to reduce uh, broadband costs for our residents. And this is absolutely a priority for us. But you don't know the timing from the Office of Technology. Uh, honestly, no, because I know there's a lot for them to review with this with the use of city capital funds. And that, it is it is an RFP process, so I don't want to step on their toes and sure. make any problems for the RFP. Sure. Should we give the Office of Technology more funding personnel? Because of course it's a big project. We're a big city. Do they need more staff to get this done again? I can't answer for them about students in NYCHA, kids in NYCHA who never got to access their coursework when stuff was remote, when school was remote for a year and a half. And I, I just want to feel the fire in your belly to fix it because these kids are so far behind. Absolutely. There's tremendous fire in my belly. I promise you that when it comes to broadband, <laughs> I spend a lot of my time on the broadband project, been very closely involved in monitoring all of our vendors and, and expanding that work. We've talked to all of the vendors to expand their portfolio, but right now, specific to your question, the RFP is within Mocto and you should definitely follow up with them to find out what they need to expedite that work. And so you're working with your current contractors to expand their breadth. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, we have six, we have six vendors on board right now to install broadband in um, various developments. They each have about three developments underneath their license agreement right now. Right. So that's 18 in total, got it. And, um, and so we've been working with them. Uh, most of them are just getting underway right now in the installation phase of that work. And once they have fully signed up the residents and are, and are stabilized, we will begin talking to them about expanding to additional developments. So none of them are up and going? No, some of them are up and, up and running. I, I don't have it all off the top of my head, but, but we've launched um, with a variety of the vendors. I, I can follow up, I can send you all of the vendors and their locations and what is running and what is still in the implementation phase. How many more do you have to go? 18. How many more sites? Yeah. Um, I wanna say there's probably only three or four sites left that are still um, in the implementation phase, but I will follow up. And after that, the ones that don't have, are not even in the beginning phases, how many? Well, I also want to add that all of our buildings right now are wired for either Fios or Spectrum or both. What this additional um, service is, is bringing uh, broadband vendors that we work with in partnership with Mocto to provide low cost or free service for our residents. Got it. However, both How many more Verizon and Fios uh, and Spectrum offer low cost programs. Right. So how many more do you have to go after this 18? We will work with the vendors to see what their capacity is and what they, what they need to expand. Do you have any plans? We have told them all that once they have successfully achieved installation at their first three developments, we will work with them to expand their portfolio. So I don't understand, what's the connection with the Mayor's Office of Technology and their- So these six vendors came to us through an RFEI that was put out in June of 2020 with Mocto and EDC as partners. And that's how these six vendors came to us. We, are ne we also have, in a, on top of that, the RFP that Mocto is working on now for additional vendors to come on board. And do you have, could you say that you have five in mind that you think should be the next five sites after this 18? 
I don't. We we have worked with Mokta. They they in the Internet Master Plan they have maps of what, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but low take up rates or low subscription rates um, for certain areas of the city that they that are um, you know that, that that have limited broadband uh, access. So we we have looked at those maps as part of as part of this process. However, some of these groups are using new time types to new types of technology that need to work off each other. So that there are these mesh networks that they need to kind of go from contiguous buildings. So some of it depends on the technology that the vendor is using and how they can expand into additional buildings. Sounds complicated. Sounds like something that if you had enough staff, you could plan for, right? And know what the next set of buildings are. I mean, this is fundamentally what the problem was with capital spending, the lack of planning. And so I'm just wondering if you're doing the planning now on a project that you're working on, but Chair Ampri Samuel, I'm sorry I interrupted you. I, I just, it's, it's sort of just screams of not planning again. And that's what got us in trouble with the, you know, lack of spending city money. Um, so I just am trying to point out, here's an opportunity where you could plan something. And as soon as the RFP is ready, you know the sites that you could go to. Um, just an idea. Well, with that, Chair Rosenthal, um, I'm gonna just ask the next question uh, about fiscal 2021 adopted budget again. Um, fiscal 2021 adopted budget redirected 22 million in capital funds and fiscal 2021 from the NYPD to NYCHA for the renovation of three currently vacant community centers. Monroe houses in the Bronx, she said Bay houses in Brooklyn and Wagner in Manhattan. Additionally, a fourth NYCHA community center located in Ocean Bay houses um, will receive expense funding to support programming to be provided by DYCD. Was the current, what's the current status of the community center renovations and how much of the 22 million has been spent? Thank you very much for um, the question. NYCHA has assigned all of these important projects to our program management to support. Um, and we've already started the surveying of the existing conditions. And we've been going out to uh, meetings with the center sponsors, tenant associations, and project managers to define the exact, exact scope as we're building out those A&E services. Um, and, then we, and then we move into the uh, design phase of getting those architecture and engineers on board. The target date for uh, construction start in the Sheep's Head Bay is, um, well, the design uh, for all, all of them, uh, Sheep's Head Bay, Monroe, and Wagner is spring 2020. Um, we hope to see that fall pro uh, procurement in 2022 and then start of construction for those three in spring of 2023. Now the Ocean Bay- um, Hey, one more time. Our, I'm Please sorry. Yeah, I, um, I have a mask on. So uh, Sheep's Head Bay, Monroe, and Wagner, the design is should be going out and it should be starting in spring of 2020. Um, 2020? 2021, excuse me. I, 2021. The procurement we're in, of we're in spring. We are, we're in when well, we're in fall of 2021. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We didn't pass we didn't pass the spring. We spring we passed the spring of 2020 and a spring of 2021. I, I'm sorry. I'm I I'm reading my notes incorrectly. Um Sheepshead Bay, Monroe, and Wagner. Uh, the di design started in is in the process of starting. We've already gone out to those um, sponsors as we're building out the scope of those projects. And design starts in this spring, which would be 2022. So I apologize. We then hope to get these out in the fall, as we're gonna accelerate the design phase of that, as design is six to nine months and construction start is anticipated in 2023. Okay, and how do you accelerate the design phase? One more time. Yep, so we've, we've been doing this recently successfully uh, on a lot of our projects where we are 
pulling the designers together and they're building out uh, standards so that way we can execute those design projects quicker. Um, we want to do the stakeholder engagement and make sure that the, the sponsors and the residents association have the items in that scope that we can, we can do. And then by simplifying the design, creating standards, so that way the drawings are, are simplified. Uh, we meet with the Department of Buildings, so that way they know of the pipeline that's coming and then they can be prepared for that. That's how we streamline that. And you know, we've been, we've been doing that successfully on the heating plant pipeline. We did that successfully on the roofing program. And we've been recently successful in doing that on some of the design build and uh, as we're building out the waste management program. Okay, going back to Ms. Torres' um, comments during her testimony, at what point are you incorporating the residents? So we started a standard procedure. As soon as we get the funding, we're reaching out to the sponsors, the elected officials, and the residents to inform them that we received the funding. We are writing right now into our program management software, a way in which we can immediately send a letter out to all of those individuals. So that way they know exactly when the funds hit our, uh, our system. And then we continually, in terms of this program, this would be a stakeholder engagement where we're wanting the feedback uh, regularly and working as a team to get through, uh, to get the design that we want differently from, let's say for instance, a roof, which would be completely focused on a spec that we have. The residents then are helping us make the determination on the scope through the design process. We're informing everyone when those designs are done and that they have a schedule. So that way we inform everyone when it's going out to procurement as well. Our well, funder- The survey of the conditions. So you have the sign commitment and you have the survey of conditions and mm -hmm. then you want to define the scope. So the, the, yep. the survey of the conditions, is that like walking around the yep. development and surveying? Yeah, so what happens is we're trying to front these. So we're getting staff to go out, pull all the drawings, uh, pull the work ticket reports, meet with the residents, meet with the sponsor, meet with the development staff, understand the existing conditions. So that way we can build a task order. So that way the designers don't have to spend too much time doing pre-design, trying to front that. So that way the designers have the scope of work that they have to do. And then we can continue to do stakeholder engagement uh, for us to be able to, um, you know, as we get through a, a design process, schematic design, design development, construction documents. Okay, but the residents are a part of the survey, surveying of the conditions process as well. Um, the, the surveying of the conditions is a lot about pulling the work order tickets, pulling the drawings. Um, we're informing the residents of the funding, but they are not part of, they have not been part of the uh, pulling of the work order tickets and pulling of the drawings. Um, we start to, when, when we're going out to the development, we're, we're setting up the meeting to have the dialogue with the residents and the development staff. That on these three projects has not started yet in terms of going to the site and meeting with the residents and the development staff. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna just keep rolling. You good, Chair Rosenthal? You yeah, I have one more. I was gonna ask the energy question or are you going yeah, on to that? Have Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for helping us get back on track. Um, asking about the physical needs assessment and the energy audit. Um, so the physical needs assessment is required to determine capital and management improvement needs. Um, and, and these are uh, required every five to six years. So for NYCHA's next um, physical needs assessment, how will coordination between an energy auditor and a PNA provider um, be, uh, which is important for energy efficiency and capital upgrade decision-making 
And what, if any, impact do you think it'll have on NYCHA's stabilization plan and pipeline? Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. That's a great, it's a great question. Um, the physical needs assessment, uh, we are currently going out in an RFP for the new physical needs assessment. Um, we know that the last physical needs assessment was very robust in comparisons to the previous one. And so we're adding into this physical needs assessment uh, more uh, information in regards to um, building information science, building science, as well as those things like energy um, and, and how much energy that we're using. Um, we have on call, a, a which is the IDIQ, uh, energy consultants that we use regularly as we define out what the heat, next heating pipeline will be, what the next electrical needs to be. Um, and we now have that in a map uh, that allows individuals to see kind of where we wanna be in terms of our uh, energy and electrification portfolio. Okay. That's a perfect segue into the last two questions. Um, and clearly I wanna have a conversation about the Build Back Better plan, the Build Back Better bill, um, as well as where are you now with your blueprint for change? Um, so with that, um, we know that you are, well, we don't know, but possibly you'll be receiving additional federal funding through the infrastructure legislation known as the Build Back Better bill, which is currently being considered. Um, if enacted, how much is NYCHA, from what you've been hearing, expected to receive in capital funding? And how would such funding be allocated through the authority's portfolio? And will the increase in additional funding mean that city spending will be um, prioritized in a different way? And do you anticipate a deadline for those federal funds? And as you're answering that, I want you to then you know, start to just talk about the blueprint for change that you've been talking about for a very long time and where it is in the state legislature and look at those plans versus what you would be receiving um, under the Build Back Better bill. Um, and um, it reminds me of Marquise Jenkins during his testimony he mentioned, you know, would there be a need for these conversions if you have this, um, you know, infusion of funding in looking at your spend plan? And we've been joined by Councilmember Gibson. So, so thank you so much. And this is really timely because uh, there is rumors that uh, the House may pass the uh, Build Back Better bill to tonight, their version. Um, the Senate still does not have language in their version. So we... What we know is that public housing is um, right now a priority um, both in, in both houses, but we do not have the fi final uh, dollar amount of what, we're, you know, what we are going to get. Um, what I can tell you though, that we are already planning and that we are not only planning on our own, but we are also planning with the, um, with the uh, CCOM. Um, and we have an agreement with them that you know, with the funding that we're going to get here, rather than um, the way NYCHA has traditionally spent money, where we've spent money on roofs, one development, spent money on boilers in another development, and spread the money around, we're going to look to do comprehensive modernization. Um, that means we will go into a development and take care of, from the roof, inside people's apartments, um, take care of the plumbing, all the way down into we have of the boilers. We, the agreement with the CCOP goes as far as naming the priority developments that need um, the investment. And this is based on um, years of capital needs, um, the PNA, um, and also work order tickets um, that you know, are associated with the developments. This is a stark agreement with where tenants and NYCHA sat down for for months to hammer this out, 
to have a plan. And so we are ready to go when, when that funding is received. As far as how this relates to the trust, I just wanna say that this, the federal funding that we get, and we are really grateful to the delegation who has been a national leader here to make sure that public housing is not forgotten in Washington in the infrastructure bill. This is only capital dollars, right? So we have an issue both on the capital side and the expense side, right? The trust is a little bit different. The trust, you know, you know, would be able to, you know, have money that we could spend on both capital and operating. So we will see improvements on the capital side, um, depending on how much money we get, but we will still have an operating issue that we'll have to um, we'll have to deal with. Um, until we have a final dollar amount, um, we that will also determine, you know, next course uh, on the trust. I do not want to make a commitment now um, because, you know, I, I, you know, I, I would never want to have a read my lips moment. Um, but, um, you know, if we're able to, you know, fund, fund these developments, it's a very, you know, totally with the, uh, that would be a very different conversation than we were having earlier in the year um, when the trust was our only avenue um, to bring in capital and operating dollars. So, the next few weeks should be interesting. We talk to um, leadership in both houses um, all the time, um, literally daily. Um, and we are, you know, we're, we're ready to go also to with a plan to spend these dollars. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I don't have any follow-up questions related to that. I wanna make sure that my co-chair, okay. okay. All right, so um, we'll be waiting and clearly we'll have a conversation once that bill is passed and the money comes down. My final question is just uh, for clarifications because people talk about the federal monitor all the time. Um, and so I just want, again, for clarification, what is the federal monitor's role based on your interaction when it comes to the spending of city capital dollars as it relates to the HUD agreement and the city capital action plan? So what's the monitor, the federal monitor's actual role? And I, and I ask that question because, um, you know, some people you know, have that conversation around, should the federal monitor even be invited to city council hearings and what would that look like? And so what is the federal monitor's role as it relates to? Sure, thank, thank you, Chair. The, uh, the federal monitor has a role in, in monitoring some portion of our city capital plan. It is not our entire city capital budget that is under their purview. It's a very specific amounts detailed in the HUD agreement that are meant to be spent on the pillar areas in order to improve our performance in areas that were deemed deficient and non-compliant through the HUD agreement. Through that role and what does it mean to really be a monitor? It means that we are required to submit the action plan to lay out collaboratively how we plan to spend that money. We have to provide those quarterly reports, but we have a very collaborative uh, relationship with the monitor, you know, through our work on the CAC, they, we have uh, regular meetings with them to talk about our progress on the capital, to talk about ideas on how to improve capital efficiency. So we are working closely with them. They are looking at our spending, our planning, everything that goes into the capital projects that are under their purview of the agreement. And that's laid out in the city capital action plan. Can I just ask on that? In that interaction, do they ever ask you to change things or clarify things? I mean, is it a dialogue or is it, and what changes have you made? They, what have they asked you to make and what have you made? They have given us some, some helpful feedback in our, in our planning process as we've, you know, for example, as we've gone through design build for the first time, they've brought some expertise there. And so we work with them, you know, really on a very regular basis as collaborators to, to they, so they give us feedback on management decisions, on um, implementation of the projects, um, but it is, it is a give and take, it is a debate. We don't take every idea that they give us. We have different of opinions on some things, can you, but we work can together you give, on that. Yep, can you give one example of a management uh, suggestion they made that you took? 
specifically on capital, uh, like on the capital project implementation? Steve, I don't know if you have anything that comes to mind. I'd have to think about it a little bit more. Or any that you rejected? I mean, they give you management suggestions, like what? Um, well, in terms of the capital portfolio, the majority of the relationships that we've been having are going through the projects um, and we meet month, uh, we meet basically regularly. Um, they have access to all of our systems. And so um, it's a dialogue that we are working through um, everything from stakeholder engagement as well as, excuse me, um, uh, outreach to our vendors um, and, and how some of the schedules are. A lot of those changes, you know, we're, we're working with them. It's, it's kind of, and sometimes uh, a connection um, in terms of the design build uh, RFP, as Eva mm -hmm. had mentioned, um, they edited through uh, all of those RFQs, RFPs, uh, and there were a number of different things that we, we worked through um, in terms of making it a better RFQ and RFP. Uh, again, you know, um, public money is being spent on the monitor, NYCHA is funded through public money. These answers are very genuine, general. I wish you could have said, yeah, they said we had, you know, if you look at the process, there are three stages and they said we have too many people at stage one and not enough at stage two. And then you made that change. I'm making this up, right? I don't, I don't know what happens in these meetings. I don't know. I don't, I've never looked at, you know, your, all your internal workings, but I wish you could give the public um, an example of, of what has come out of those hearings. But, you know, I will also say we've belabored all of this so much and I see the residents waiting to speak and I appreciate them so much. Um, it shouldn't have to be like pulling teeth like this. It just shouldn't have to be. Um, anyway. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. Um, that is, that completes my line of questioning for today for NYCHA. Um, again, I was, you know, we start off with residents um, who testify and, and, and kind of let us know what questions we should ask. And, you know, I always try to bring it back to what a resident said um, to make it make sense and to have a, a, a visual. And so, um, you know, clearly we're going to have to continue these conversations and just hoping that this allows for the incoming council members to get a sense of what's happening and the questions that they should be asking and continuing on this dialogue. So with that, that ends my questions for NYCHA. Um, however, we have with us um, resident Maria Forbes who came right at the tail end of the resident testimony earlier. And so um, I wanna make sure that we go right back to um, to the residents and making sure that we give you know time and you hear um, what Maria Forbes has to say and share um, as we did earlier before you leave. So I'll stop there and kick it back over to Audrey. Great, thanks so much. Um, as Chair Amprey Samuel said, we will now be turning to testimony from the remaining members of the public. We thank you again for your patience. Um, please listen for your name. I will call you one by one and will periodically announce the person who is next. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer for at two minutes uh, and announce that you may begin. So we will uh, begin with Maria Forbes, followed by Beverly McFarlane. Good it's evening to all. Can you hear me? We hear you. Good evening to all. I would just like to say on the behalf of the Citywide Council of President Danny Barber, I 
he yields his time to me. That's why I came in so late. So that I do ask that I be given or granted a little bit more time. And I'm asking that of both of the chairs at some point. Um, my name is Maria Forbes. I'm a New York City Housing Authority Tenant Association president at a development called Claremont Consolidated. It's over 750 units here. Um, I just became hired for New York City Housing Authority. My time hours are four hours a day, so there's no conflict of interest here. Myself and Danny Barber, the citywide chair, have been working very closely since July to discover the overwhelming, enormous bureaucracy that the Capitol Department has. In 2019, Danny Barber was able to bring up the elevator team, the roofing team, and the boiling team to Bronx South District. And we discussed the repairs of the developments said to whatever extent that was going to be done. Unfortunately, that meeting was held in November and the pandemic hit us right in January. So which everything was brought to a halt. But in knowing where I'm at, I'm working at Morris Houses, but I wanna start with Danny Barber's development, which is Jackson. He is in coal, the coal. He literally has a coal right now and his family member who he is taking care of has a cold. So there's a lack of eating going on there. And if I can say that I'm at Morris Houses and that contract has started two years ago and they will be the another two years, I'm more than sure that that is the same for Danny. And that is the same for the roofing contract for Morris and Jackson Houses, that it is just unbelievable that you have the roofers saying now that they have to kind of stop because they only have a certain amount of material and that they're running out of material. Madam Chair, you extended me the courtesy to finish on Danny Barber's time. And please do, please do, please do. Okay, so some contractors are saying because of the shortage of material and stuff, they cannot even begin to move forward. I wanna say that in May, an emergency happened here at Claremont Consolidated in which a fire escape contracted was expedited, expedited, and the funding was moved forward from May and the contract started in September. So for this capital department to say the bureaucracy in the controller's office to the bureaucracy anywhere else. I've been down to the United Nations and to learn in 2016 of the new urban agenda, which has 17 sustainable goals for human beings, for human beings, and that they were there planning from 2016 to 2030. And that NYCHA still does not have anything together yet. It's still on, it's, it's just uncalled for because if they say they got one plan, online that people should be reading and it was out since 20, March 2021 the transitional plan to the capital action plan you could plan for so much but you're not planning enough for the residents and I'll say that because if you go to these developments um Alika it is inhumane and deplorable at Morris houses you have the contractors for the boiler and the roofers who have dug up the entire development and the rats on the development. Let me just finish. The rats on the development. And I had requested a meeting when people came before me, and as well as Danny Barber, that I had to bring him because how could NYCHA hire 10 subcontractors to the contractor and it ran circles around the tenant association president who could not even begin to negotiate no services. And if you say that you're here for the residents, let's get to article section number 44, page five with section three. These developers, contractors, whoever they may be, come in the development and offer no economic development for the residents whatsoever, none. And Danny is having the problem that um, Miss Grady at Morris Houses having, that no residence was hired for either of the contractors, let it be the roofers or the boiler contractor. But there are too many 
to have a contractor who's hired by NYCHA say to me, NYCHA inspectors didn't know what they was doing. Mm -hmm. That's why they hired me from outside anyway. But you have close to 10 subcontractors. $38 million at Morris Houses is being wasted. Because why? You take 10 people, give them 100000 that's a million dollars on a contract right there. Where did NYCHA sit down and scope out the work as to what they were supposed to be doing? And let me explain that because I heard a lot out of a lot of people in saying residents was being displaced to, for the roof contractors. 16 residents had to be relocated on the weekend in the middle of COVID. Now... Where were they going? On a Saturday and Sunday with no place to go. There was no courtesy location made for them whatsoever. But here people do shopping, cooking, cleaning, and arranging for themselves to be doing their weekend duties. And they said, you have to turn that off. That they arranging to do weekend services for their own families, but a contractor is displacing them with no courtesy room, no nothing, uh, unheard of until I got there to say, uh, no, let me call the Department of Transportation because if NYCHA scopes out these contracts and see what they're doing to the residents, the digging up of the property, all of this fencing, no garbage being collected. It is unbelievable that I had to negotiate with the Bronx Office of DOT to have the permit for it to be arranged on a weekday. Why? People go to work, go to school, ain't nobody home. But when you're taking families out of their household on the weekend to do all of what you want to do, that is inconsiderate. That is very inconsiderate. Let me just add on another couple of points that this that the capital department has no consideration for, they don't even have no courtesy, professionalism, and respect. So let alone the human lives of people who've been suffering public housing for some time. I contacted, I'm gonna just say this about, I contacted a natural staff here and they said they had been there and it looked like the garbage had been behind the fence for two years. So that's very inhumane and deplorable. So moving on, the money is being wasted under this capital situation. Um, a IG needs to be called in to investigate the investigators because I don't see that the monitor done anything. From when that monitor came on, I stayed up several nights, several nights to bring myself from 1990 to 2018, 19 when he got there until 4 a.m. writing him notes. Then you know what he told me? He said, we don't answer you. You'll get some information when I do my quarterly quarterly report. He needs an inspector to watch him, but inspectors need to be there to watch what is really going on. Because all you hear is I'm a project manager. It's seven project managers to eight project managers on the boiler contract at Morris and at Jackson. You just can't make that up of a wasteful amount of dollars that are being spent. Um, somebody needs to oversee residents being removed from their home on the weekend. And I just, I, I, I would have to end because I, it is deplorable. The rats, so I was able to organize it. And I'll end with that. I was able to organize it somewhat. Call in all the 15 to 25 Sub, 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 subcontractors. I don't know why the waste of money is being spent there with their project managers, like everybody was following somebody, and say, bring your exterminators to the table. All three exterminators need to come to the table. Then Reese needs to come to the table. Everybody needs to give a weekly report as to what is being done at these developments. So now Danny has a cold. His brother, who's very ill, we all know that, that his brother is catching the flu. But then Morris Houses Community Center don't even have no heat, and they're servicing our children in replace of whatever. Back to Verizon L, whatever they want to call that. What is that internet service called? Fios. Fios. I went to a board meeting with NYCHA back in 2014. 
to hear that Nigel was giving Verizon another $5 million. You talk about your broadband services. Let me tell you what happened to our intercom services that we have not gotten restored since NYCHA went into the bed with Verizon back when, but they still continue to give them. Go to those board meetings, whoever the residents here on the phone, and you will see that NYCHA continues to spend $5 million with Verizon on a regular basis, and we still don't have intercoms, but the capital money is being <laughs> wasted. I don't know to say the tears down because that build back better situation, if I help out to wait for build back better, thinking that my buildings would be repaired and posed to going into red, I'm going to be sorry mistaken because the physical needs assessment is beyond the $80 billion that we've been looking for. Once they targeted the three to four buildings that they're going to utilize first, it's almost a tear down situation to build it back up. But I'm scared to say that because you know what I knew when Bush was getting ready to talk about he, he was closing public housing? That the people above will always need 100,000 poor people. Why? So that their cousin, uncle, sister, brother, father, and their daughters could have a job. But we are still not being servicing in the manner in which we need to be servicing it. And this is an epic portion emergency. New York City, if we was the epic center of the virus, we are the epic center of housing. Housing needs to be addressed here first and foremost. Thank you so much for allowing me to change. Thank, thank you so much, Ms. Forbes. Thank you. And I want to tell everyone I did receive a text message from um, C uh, President Chair Danny Barber, and I do wish him well. And he did ask if we could um, make sure that um, you provide us with words from him. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Beverly McFarlane, followed by Kevin Lindahl. Starting time. <clears throat> good e good evening, everyone. My name is Beverly McFarlane. I am the uh, resident uh, association president for Senator Robert A. Taft Houses. I'm here tonight to also testify on the negligence of NYCHA and, uh, and their protocols. I, I sit on the, uh, every two weeks in a meeting for the key, key performance indicators that is data that NYCHA are given um, that gives to uh, records for the chair, I mean, for the federal monitor. I hear tonight everyone talking, um, NYCHA staff talking about what they don't know, what they do not know. I don't understand when there's a dashboard available to them that's called under the key um, performance indicators that they can see everything that's happening because they give that information to the federal monitor. So why wouldn't they be able to answer any of the questions that was brought to them by if they have statistics and they have a data dashboard that has that they have to put this in for the for the monitor. Also, I, here at TAF, four four days in a row we had no water, no water. Period. Thank you, Brian, for um, expediting it. But this is a, a continuous um, problem here at TAF, and they are not they are not this this model this neighborhood model crap that they talking about, it, it is not working. It is not working for any of these development. It is the same people that they just shift around and, and, and it's the same management is shift around to different developments and we get the same results. And also the, the, the uh, blueprint for change, they are trying to bunch them together, the blueprint for change along with the transitional plan, the transition plan. They are two separate entities. And they do, should not be on NYCHA's um, website I'm as fine. one entity. They are they. So I'm requesting that they take the blueprint for change down off the website because that has not been approved by the uh, for, from HUD. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. We will now hear from Kevin Lindahl, followed by Joel Kupferman, and then Joshua Barnett. Starting time.
Okay, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about housing first. And um, there's these background checks for the homeless where they like to see what the misdemeanor record is, the criminal record, people uh, in their background accused of trespassing, drug abuse, um, selling drugs, in some cases shoplifting. But all of this stems from, the belief was in Finland in this Housing First program was that this stems from the incredible stress of being homeless. All the energy that the homeless have to use is to try to survive. They don't, they don't know where they're going to sleep at night. They don't know how they're going to make it through the winter. Um, so instead of having this, this background check that looks at the background and says, well, how do they have a misdemeanor? Do they have a criminal background? They said, what if the stress of trying to survive is what's causing them to engage in you know, drug use, selling drugs, trying to make money, trespassing? And so what they did is they said in Finland, Let's do housing first. Let's get these homeless into homes, off the streets, relieve that stress and see what happens to these other issues. And suddenly the other issues began to melt away. Um, shoplifting and misdemeanor offenses were reduced by over 80% when we said, you know what, forget about your background. We're getting you a place to sleep, a place to shower, a place where you can reorganize yourself, get back into the workforce. Shoplifting and misdemeanors dropped by 80%, drug use by 60%, and trespassing all but became non-existent because now these people had a place to stay. So I'm asking the Council of New York City to consider leading from the heart and implementing Housing First. It worked in Finland, where we say, you know what, of course a homeless person is going to have an imperfect background. Look at how many more homeless people we have now with COVID, people who've never been homeless in their lives, freezing out there in the streets. Let's ignore the background first, get them in the housing, and you're going to see these criminal misdemeanor issues. If Finland is a model for this, all but I'm expired because it's the stress of being a homeless that's causing these other problems. If we get them in the homes and eliminate the red tape and these background checks, watch these other problems actually disappear. It's called Housing First, and it's out of Finland, and I think we should implement it here in New York City. And if we lead by the heart, this could save a lot of people. Thank you. Thanks so much. We will now hear from Joel Kupferman, followed by Joshua Barnett. Starting time. I'm having a little trouble here. We hear you, Joel. OK. Um, Thank you very much. I am counsel to Alfred E. Smith Resident Association, St. Nick's, and resident to preserve public housing. I think it's important to point out that public housing residents die from the coronavirus at a rate tw nearly twice their share of the city's population, according to a recent DOH study. A Harvard study has also showed a slight increase in PM 2.5, that's the dust exposure causes a large increase in COVID mortality. NYCHA is totally a vulnerable population with asthmatics, elderly people, and 9-11 victims. What we're facing here under capital construction is haphazard construction, unfettered, unaccountable, and fatal to many, many residents, um, not only to the residents, and to the trees. New York City has 2,400 acres of, of open space 1,400 acres um, of tree space in NYCHA. Capital construction, um, rebuild plans have actually cut into those trees. The contractors have not been held accountable. We're losing more trees than are going in. And yet, despite all the evidence that we're presenting, we're not getting any type of um, payback or accountability of those, of those people. New York City, New York State has a bad actor policy. NYCHA keeps on hiring bad contractors, doesn't hold them accountable. There's ways that you should weed them out and not hire the, the bad people. Natural resource destruction, like I said, continues. At Smith, they're building storm barriers that are ADA in violation. Not only they're bad ADA violation, but the Justice Department's gonna require NYCHA to rebuild those. We should look at all the capital construction and make sure that it's ADA um, acceptable and not bringing people in. I just want to say this: there's plenty. So there's, you know, we've been working this for a long time. 
But also one more thing I want to say about the Public Housing Preservation Trust, the way the bill stands now, it exempts that whole change from any type of environmental review. It is totally wrong, illegal, and not only that, in the face of rising um, tide and climate change, you cannot transfer and take out all of these nitrogen properties out of environmental review and say it's okay. It's an insult to the health and the safety of all those nitrogen residents. Thank you. And I'm open to questions. And there's also more testimony to do, but I really want to say is that, that all the information we brought on contractor malfeasance has just been disregarded by capital division. This, there should be more specifications in those contracts. And we've brought in federal agencies offering technical help to NYCHA capital, which has been refused or ignored. There's a lot of resources that could be um, that have made available. And I believe that NYCHA um, should be pushed and the city council should make sure that those are reviewed. Thanks, Thank Bruce. you. Thank you. We will now hear from Joshua Barnett. Starting time. Oh yeah, hi, sorry. Um, yeah, my name is Josh Barnett um, with Local 375 DC 37. I'm a delegate and shop steward. I'm also an architect in the NYCHA design department. I've been here since 1999. I would definitely want to signify what all the residents have said in terms of the conditions that they face, not having a voice at the table, also being really terrified of NYCHA's commitment to privatization, both under RAD um, and the blueprint, especially because I think both have strong union busting aspects but in terms of what this count, what, um, and that the main problem we're facing is 40 years of chronic underfunding from HUD and from the feds and at all levels of government. But what this hearing is about is NYCHA making the worst of a bad situation. Council member Rosenthal kept on saying how staff has been cut. When I started housing in 99, there were 445 people in the technical titles. We're down to 245. Now we were down to 200 at one point. And a lot of that isn't the result of current NYCHA policy, again, that's under funding, but what management doesn't talk about, that they never talk about, is their shadow army of consultants that cost twice as much as we do, and somehow there's money for them, for the staff augmenters, for outsourcing. The bureaucracy is incredibly top-heavy. We don't need more project managers. We need more people to do the work. I've never seen an organization like this where there's more people invested in watching people work and actually executing the work. One resident said NYCHA is so top-heavy, it's the one that doesn't topple over. So I know I'm running out of time, but the one thing that I would really urge this committee to do is do a full audit of NYCHA, how they spend their money on consultants, making sure they do get the best of every dollar and making sure that you really hear from the staff and the residents getting past the people who speak for us and speak to us directly because we really know how bad NYCHA is tripping over itself. There's no reason why there should be any money left expended. We have the expertise to do it, but we're not being given the opportunity opportunity. So thank you. Thanks very much. Um, this concludes the public testimony portion of the hearing. If we have inadvertently forgotten to call on anyone to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and we will try to hear from you. Uh, I believe that we've heard from all present. Uh, I just so want to make sure that Ramona Farrash, I know she testified earlier. I just want to make sure that her hand is not raised again. Sure, Chair, uh, would, would you want to hear from her um, again at this point? Yeah, I've had my I want to make sure. Okay. Yeah, I did. Uh, thank you for, I don't know if you want to set the time. It should yeah, be starting time. So I listening to NYCHA's really um, disappointing responses, a couple questions came to my mind that I didn't hear asked. One of them was, has NYCHA adjusted its operating um, budget to reflect the decline in funding from Congress? The second one is the transformation plan, which you are touting as the answer to our issues and your obstacles to succeed at your jobs, is the implementation plan for the blueprint, which we have clearly rejected. So when will you be delivering a new operational plan that keeps us in section nine, 
The next question is, what spending have you actually done on the blueprint plan itself? I know that there's a contract item for a consultant, like Josh just mentioned, for $250,000, but it's really difficult to search for your spending according to category. Um, I can provide that to the council. And then regarding the community center's funding and turning to cornerstones, we still receive $25 per household. Is that correct? But you take a portion of that. What is that portion? And what do you do with the portion that you take out of tenant association funding? And finally, the recent storms have made it very clear that you are not being a good steward of our lands. And we don't have an arborist on staff at NYCHA, although you are one of the biggest landowners in New York City. When will you stop subcontracting arborists and when will you actually hire one? And what pocket of funding will that come from? I gotta walk my dog. So I don't know if they have these answers, but <laughs> I gotta, I really have to run. I appreciate you. And we will make sure that um, we respond to those questions. I, and I want to thank you both for putting this together. And I really appreciate Chair Rosenthal's facial expressions because they matched mine a lot of times. Time expired. Alika, I wish you the best. And I know that we'll definitely, you know, continue to see you do great things for us. Um, and, you know, thanks so much for putting this together before the year ended. Yeah, I'm not very good at poker. <laughs> I suck at poker. So does my dog. Mm. But I too appreciate Chair and Bree Samuel. Um, Biden is so lucky to get her. NYCHA residents are so lucky to get her um, for the record. And Helen, if I could just add, in terms of the, the arborist and the, the tree situation, we'll definitely get plenty of information to, the, to, uh, to, to, your, to your committee. Thank That's you. a major problem at Smith. I mean, it's, it was actually probably millions of dollars worth of damage across the whole city at my trip. Okay, thanks. Thanks everyone for your testimony. Uh, I believe that this now concludes the time of public testimony as we've heard from all present. Uh, we thank you again for your patience and for uh, coming to testify. Um, I will now turn it back over to Chairs Amphrey Samuel and Rosenthal to close the hearing. We have one more hand. Oh, I see Ms. Forbes' hand, and then that, and we'll close with Ms. Forbes. Okay, we'll close. And, uh, what, I would, time. what I would also like to add, I'm very glad that the gentleman brought up. When I tell you that I see the dust, the asbestos in the mold to the developments that these contractors have come to steer up, there's no consideration for our health at all whatsoever. And that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for everyone for sticking around and participating and showing up and um, like just telling us your truth and adding to this discussion. As I said earlier, the purpose was for us to be able to get a, a understanding of how you are spending your funding and what are you going to do You know, as we move towards um, the future, um, knowing that and anticipating and a, a great amount of funding coming in from the federal government. So um, with that, I look forward to our conversations in the next couple of weeks, depending on what comes down from the federal government and I'll kick it over to Chair Rosenthal. Uh, I think you've covered all the bases, Chair Amprey Samuel. It's always a pleasure to have a hearing with you. Okay. And to and be so, in the purpose with you. Thank you. I appreciate you too. Um, and with that, I want to thank Audrey Sun, Jose Condi, Ricky Chala, my deputy sitting right here, Naomi, um, as well as Everton, and the amazing, amazing um, um, sergeant at arms that we have that are doing so much work in the background. I thank you and appreciate you for all the work that you do. And I look forward to um, being at state in the chamber so we can see each other face to face. So shout out to the sergeant at arms. <laughs>
And thanks for everyone for putting this together. And Audrey, I am, I'm good. Yes. Hello, 